happening. You will hear things you have not heard in church. If you are easily shaken by the truth this is not the show for you. You are watching now you see TV. Time to wake up. And good evening. Welcome to Now You See TV. I'm your host, Jake Grant. And tonight, contending against the brainwash status quo, Now You See TV welcomes a special panel of individuals who are all involved in the making of the film Scientism Exposed 2 by Robbie Davidson. We're going to be joined tonight by Rob Skiba, Rick Hummer, Robbie Davidson, Joe Taylor, Zen Garcia, Jared Cressman, and Dean Nodal. And we'll all be discussing the great battle that is beginning to be waged against the deceptive nat nature of modern science. And so tonight we're going to be talking about the film and the lies that are being revealed worldwide regarding evolution and the nature of the cosmos, the holy scriptures, and the evil agenda pushing it all. So tonight I want to welcome you all. First, I'm going to introduce those who are represented on our panel. Uh, we're going to start with Dean. Welcome, Dean Odal, to Now You See TV. Uh, thank you for having me, brother. It's good to be here. Excellent. And next, Joe Taylor. Welcome, Joe. Good evening. Good to be here. And next, Robbie Davidson. Welcoming uh, the man of the hour who made this film happen, Robbie. Thanks for having me. Again, I'm really excited about this show. It's a long time overdue, but it's going to be a lot of fun tonight. So I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you. Excellent. And Jared Cressman. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for having me on and get to be a part of this and hang out with my Flat Earth peeps, man. So I appreciate it, Jake. Right on. Zen Garcia, welcome. Always an honor, brother. And uh, I see Rick Hummer joined into the call. Can you hear us, Rick? 10-4, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Right on. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, good. we can. Good. And we will be joined uh, a little bit later by Rob Skiba. Uh, he had a conflict um, tonight, but he's going to be jumping into the call as soon as he can. And so tonight, I would like to start off um, with explaining kind of how this will go. We're going to be asking some specific questions to each member on this panel. And whoever on the panel wants to jump in and have a little bit of discussion regarding each of the questions, feel free to jump in at any time. And for those of you who are tuning in on YouTube, if you have questions, Please direct them to our moderators there in the YouTube chat. Thank you, moderators, for uh, catching those. And we will be asking those at the end of the show this evening. And also those who are on NowYouSeeTV.org, we have another area where you can be asking questions, and I'll show you guys. NowYouSeeTV.org is where we demonstrate all of our live shows, and you can go to the live show hub. And there at the bottom of the page, we have the YouTube link and the Now You See TV family chat. We will be asking a lot of questions from that chat as well. So if you want to be able to get involved with this show and ask questions to anybody represented here, please do that. And so the first question I'm going to start off with tonight is in uh, directed to Robbie Davidson, who created this film. And so the question is this, Robbie, in your battle for truth, what led you to specifically seek out those represented on the panel tonight uh, to be represented in your film? Well, I would say that, I mean, each one that were part of the film were huge inspirations to me. They've done incredible work and they've always been on the front lines on exposing the world's lies, especially when it came to scientism, whether it was the lies of evolution or getting into cosmology. To me, it was important to bring people together that maybe not necessarily are on the same page with everything, but we all agree that there is a lot of lies that need to be exposed. So like I said, each it was an honor uh, to to meet each one uh, in person for the filming of the uh, um, you know documentary. And to me, it couldn't have been a better uh, ensemble of great brothers. And uh, it was awesome to get to know them better and uh, be able to put everything together for people to see exactly how serious of a topic we're discussing and why we're even having this talk tonight. And before we get any further, if we could just get a, a little definition between the difference between science and scientism, which is the discussion we're going to be having tonight, Robbie. Um, I would say obviously the difference when you're getting into science and scientism, and I'm sure a lot of people on the panel can, can talk about their views on it because at the, the conference I had kind of asked each one on 
um, on the panel as well. And they had, you know, different understandings of it, but we kind of look at it as, you know, there's true science, which is good. And we're not anti-science, true science using the empirical method. You know, this is a good thing. What we're opposed to and what we're exposing is scientism. It's the religion, it's the agenda. It's the deception that's been put in place masquerading as truth. And that's exactly what the difference is. So for a lot of people, sometimes they think, oh, we're just all against science. No, we love science. But it's important for people to understand how much people have veered away from true science and how the agenda is put in place under the guise of scientism. And most of the things that we'll be discussing tonight, you're going to find out, truly aren't you know, found uh, under the scientific method. These things are more theories of men, but even deeper when you get into the theories of a spiritual dark force behind it all. Well said. And, uh, and the next question I want to ask is directed to Rick Hummer. And Rick, I wanted to ask you, what is true science compared to the theories that are presented by the establishment today? Okay. Um, well, first of all, the definition of science, I mean, just let me read what it actually says. It's the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Now, what I see that's happened is that we've been given that definition, but the information we've been given doesn't match up when you actually do the tests and you actually do the, the observations and you observe these things and, and the tests. So I, I guess just to, just to, say this in a nutshell science the definition does not match the science department i mean that's the way that i would i would have to answer that question for you yeah and, and that's the important thing is because the reality that we live in is so it's been so misconstrued when you actually look at it and the historical relevance of of the scriptures have been uh, buried uh through you know not just science books, but history books and, and so many other things. So, yeah, this is definitely a, it's a war for the mind. And I, I can honestly say that, you know, when I look at this, you know, the, the, the definition just in general has, has just been thrown out the window. Uh, when you really look at it, it's, it's, you, you get science from a department now and you either believe that department or, you know, you're a loon. Now, you mentioned that this is a war for the mind, yeah. and that kind of brings up this next question that I had for Jared Cressman, uh, which is in regards to how does the religion of science play into the great deception uh, and, and a worldwide war for our minds? Well, I'm glad you made the distinction between science and scientism because, you know, one of my personal passions in life is the study of theology, which in and of itself is a science. It's the science of what we can know about God based on a special and general revelation that's been provided to us. So in that, I don't have a problem with science or scientific research. And it's long been said that every time science reaches a new mountaintop, there's a band of theologians staring back down at them. You know, I think that there's a uh, you know, a wonderful array of things to explore scientifically, theologically in this world. But my problem is that the religion of science, as we see being formulated today, this pattern seems to be 180 degrees antithetical to every God-given conclusion given to us in his, in his word, in scripture. You know, it always steers us the complete 180 degree opposite direction uh, from what we've been told is true. And to me, that's a problem. And it ultimately seems to highlight a spiritual agenda. And as you look at, you know, some of the end times events and things in scripture prophetically that, you know, have been foretold, um, you just you, you just see lies and deception leading people uh, into sort of more and more intellectual darkness as it relates to spiritual matters, which ultimately will provide the necessary climate for, uh, you know, the Antichrist and, and, and the reign and rule that we see that's talked about in Revelation. Now, does anybody else have uh, an opinion on this topic regarding this just worldwide war for the mind? That is going on. Why? Why do you guys think that this is being perpetrated, and is something that we need to be very aware of in the days we're living in? I can speak to that. Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> if you can convince people, anybody, that there is no God, <clears throat> by using 
scientism by using bones or chemicals or rocks or anything else, if you can convince them there's no God, <clears throat> then you you can replace that with some other uh, social construct, i.e. socialism, despotism, <clears throat> any of the uh, uh, the totalitarian uh, views of, of uh, running a government. <clears throat> and that's what they continually do. Because under God, uh, God directs things. His word tells us how to live, how to be. So they don't want that because they hate God. <clears throat> and what I've seen, at least in paleontology, is uh, it's not uh, uh, Christianity versus science. It's atheism versus science. So they have to, in order to be promote atheism and sat Satanism, they have to get rid of God. <clears throat> and fossils and geology is one of, one of the main things they've used to do that, and astronomy and, and so on. Very good. And um, the next question I wanted to ask is to Dean Odell. And it was this question. Why is it important for Christians to discern between truth and fiction when it comes to modern science? Well, I kind of think that it's already been addressed in a way because, uh, as uh, Rick said, as Joe was saying, if you can if you can turn people away from believing uh, there is a God that they will have to be accountable to and that the scriptures are true, then anything goes. And uh, and then if you can get Christians to start believing some of these things that are not true, if you can lead them into one deception, then it's much easier to lead them into other deceptions. And so it's just very important. You know, Jesus said that, uh, you know, Matthew 4, 4, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, um, you know, every word is important and it's very important, especially when in literal things like creation that we take God literally, that he meant what he said about things like the firmament, like the shape of the earth, uh, the, the nature, the course and movement of the sun, moon and stars. I mean, he, he wasn't, wasn't joking about that. So, um, anyway, that's, that's my view on that. All right. And um, the next question I wanted to ask is in regards to some of the other topics that were covered in the movie Scientism Exposed to you guys, uh, so Robbie really brought out that the evolutionary model and theory uh, had a bunch of holes in it. And I wanted to ask Joe a question. And in regards to the archaeological discoveries that you've made that challenge established science regarding this theory of evolution that's often pushed as science, uh, why do you think the world turns such a blind eye to this evidence that is coming out? <clears throat> well, for the last 150 years, uh, the evil powers that be have had control of the press. Uh, they've taken control of the major universities around the world. And <clears throat> in doing that, they control all the common people through the news media. They control all the, uh, the academics and the people that are educated. Uh, through the universities. <clears throat> so once you've turned out a couple of generations of uh, socialists, Marxists, evolutionists, then uh, <clears throat> that filters down into the churches. They've corrupt the churches now. So the, a lot of churches are, are, you know, they're soft on evolution or they accept it outright, which is a really a stupid contradiction. <clears throat> uh, that's like someone introducing their wife and saying, this is not my wife, but I'm married to her. Well, wait a minute, that's a contradiction, is it? Well, you know, I can see the contradiction there, but not really. Well, yeah, there is a contradiction. To say that <clears throat> that uh, uh, we just sort of evolved around and, and got to be knowledgeable apes that decided that, you know, we all believe in, let's make up a God, and then let's make up guilt and have sin, and we'll put people to death for murder and stuff like that. That's what they want us to believe. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if that's the case, then... Oh, uh, anything goes like like Dean said. It's like tribalism. Uh, whatever the chief says is law. And if the next bigger chief down the road comes along and puts him out of business, then he's the chief and his law goes. That's what they're trying to do. They're, they're fighting God. The whole thing's against God. They don't want to acknowledge Him, so they take a a little pig bone of some sort of animal from. Uh, uh, 
Egypt and say, oh, look, this evolved into a mastodon over here in where? America? Uh, where's all the ones in between? And then it evolved into something else over in England and back and forth. It's all complete nonsense. <clears throat> they, they don't have anything physical to show except that, yes, there's a little animal here and another animal there, one over here. The rest of it is just religion. It's just belief. It's mm -hmm. art. Well, that's it. I, I, the education system is nothing more than an indoctrination system, and that's the bottom line, and, and as well as our culture. And like you said, Joe, in, in, in the uh, film, uh, when you pointed to the, the large femur, um, by the way, can you hear me better, Jake? Because I got the message. Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay. Um, you know, when you pointed to that, that huge femur bone and you said, you know, there's a reason why they're not bringing this kind of stuff up. It's because it gives, it leads uh, credence and, and, you know, clarity and credibility to the Bible. And that's exactly what they want out. I mean, they're not teaching anything in, in the scriptures uh, or teaching anything in the schools from the scriptures um, any longer that I can find. And I just have to say, man, if we continue down this road, um, you know, it's already here. I don't, I don't know. I've heard so many people that are believers say, well, you know, well, what it happens, I'm like it's happening now. This is, this is an ongoing issue here. This has been going on for a couple of generations now, you know, just in the, just in the school alone. So. One point I want to make is, is the fact that, you know, obviously Satan is the father of all lies. And when you get into it and we got it, we talked, you know, at the beginning of the film about evolution, Really? Is it so, you know, like hard to understand the fact that it's like, do you think that's the only part he lied about? You know, so really when it gets into cosmology, it's like if he's the father of lies and he's going to throw this into the indoctrination system in the textbooks and we know they're lying to us completely outright when it comes to evolution. Doesn't it make sense? He would lie to us about everything. I mean, how do we trust anything when it comes from modern day mainstream science? So that's why I always look at this as incredibly important for all branches of you know, scientific research to look at, especially that they've exposed certain levels and they're like, well, they're trying to hide things. Well, what if they're trying to hide a lot more, especially when it comes to cosmology? And we'll talk more mm -hmm. about that. So I think that that always is something that I talk to a lot of people about, because again, there's a lot of Christians that track already. I mean, there's been wonderful research that's done like Joe and the creation ministries that have really exposed the lies of evolution. They've done it successfully for quite a few years. So now that this new investigation with what we're doing, it's relatively new. It's going to take some time. But the question is, is it worthwhile pursuit? for people to look into absolutely because there are lies everywhere and we're exposing them one by one every day let me share something about that real quick though the i mean we know we've pretty much uh as the church of jesus christ we've pretty much lost this generation if if this hasn't come around i gotta share this is good news of course robbie you shared a video about uh, the, the article talking about the increase in 18 to 24 year olds well something the same week that was just really cool, of course, uh, this teacher friend of ours may lose their job over this, but um, she's the uh, one of the uh, wives of one of my elders in our church, and she teaches uh, German. And the, the last couple of days, the students just in this week were talking among themselves. She's never brought up Flat Earth. She's never brought up Biblical Cosmology. And the students were talking about flat earth, a group of them in her class, whether the earth was flat, whether it was round and finally turned around and asked her what she thought. And she told them, yeah, it's flat. And let me tell you, she said for the next couple of days, the both her classes, that's all they wanted to talk about. And she explained to them, you know, why she believed it, why, you know, it was in the Bible and, and, uh, but told them, go research it yourself. And uh, they were fired up about it. So, of course, now she may be called into the principal's office over this. Uh, <laughs> but but still, I, what, what encouraged me is you, you think about these kids that are just these kids that are just lost in this world. They're they're taught evolution. They're taught all this scientism nonsense. Uh, they're just into video games and TVs and movies and pop culture. But all of a sudden, they're getting excited and talking about whether the earth is round or flat in their high school classes. So Great. something is brewing. Sure thing. Yeah, and the teacher's going to get an F now. 
<laughs> they're gonna they're gonna bring her. They're gonna rope her in real quick. I hope not. But pray for. Her. Yeah, definitely. Be praying for her, man. Is, is, is that's a is that a school there near you, Dean? Yes, it's one of the public high schools here. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was that was this week. That was like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. Well, she's gonna get called into the office. I'm sure. I think that is just indicative of that this generation, they really do want answers and that they are seeking hungry. truth when they can find it and that they really are hungry for direction. But there's not a lot of people out there that they can go to to get truth. Uh, we talked about how reality is a, a construct of the mind and with the whole educational process and the brainwashing and the indoctrination that they go through, they are taught to ignore and to contradict everything that they see with their senses and that they experience daily. Uh, the fact that, you know, science basically affirms that uh, the earth is moving faster than the speed of sound, faster than a, a bullet shot from the gun. And when then they go to uh, the beach for vacation, they see that the horizon is flat uh all the way out on all sides and that the sun when it sets uh they see the rays reach all the way to their viewpoint and their perspective i mean these kind of things totally contradict what we are taught in school and so when they get a little glimpse of truth from somebody that uh has different perspective well it very much intrigues them and so um, it's a catalyst, you know, to start them on a journey to awakening. And I think that's a really positive thing. Dean, we had somebody from the chat wondering what subject was it that she was teaching? Um, was it one related to cosmology or what, what was her subject? No, no, she teaches German. She's a German teacher language. She said they were just talking amongst themselves, like before class started and, uh, having this whole group conversation of about flat earth. <laughs> <laughs> and then ask her what she believed about it. Did she, what does she think? And she said, yeah, it's flat. They were shocked. I mean, they, they were like, what, 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 you know, and then they wanted to talk to her <laughs> and she finally had to tell them like the second or third day, look, I, I don't mind talking to you. We're going to have to talk about this stuff. Like before class or after class, we we're taking up too much class time <laughs> talking about the shape of the earth and, and the cosmos and all that stuff. But, uh, it was, it, it's pretty neat to see these kids. Obviously they're hearing it from somewhere, whether they're, they're finding it online themselves or they're starting to ask these questions, or maybe they, you know, maybe there's some adults in their lives that are starting to ask these questions, but I just thought it was uh, really cool. Yeah. She doesn't teach science at all. <laughs> I mean, she's, she, uh, I think in the last couple of years, she's, she taught German and Spanish, but now just German. Mm. That video right. that, oh, sorry. That video that uh, Dean was bringing up just really quickly, um, that I put out basically was a survey done. Um, I think it was just around 10,000 people surveying to kind of, kind of get the population of, of the U S but anyways, what was staggering about that is they found that six, I think it was around 66% now, um, are, you know, believing the earth to be spherical. The rest are questioning it. So what I'm saying is regardless from the subject, a lot of people come to it and they just think, what in the world, these guys are talking about flat earth. That's crazy, but it's having a major effect. I mean, we cannot ignore the fact that, you know, this is happening and what that survey conclusively said was that 2% completely say that the earth is flat now two percent of say you know a population of a million that's still twenty thousand people the un interesting thing here though is i would say that eighty percent of that usually are pretty quiet because again there's ridicule there's a lot of uh, persecution that comes with this topic so again more and more people are getting the courage to come out but again this is an important you know discussion because like i said if it's not uh, important why having such a major uh, you know impact but also this this we shouldn't even be having the show you know um if it's that silly there's a lot more going on that meets the eye for sure sorry mm -hmm. go ahead uh, jared no i was just you know what dean was talking about with that local school you know i've heard stories from students in my part of the world um where debate classes speech classes have been opening up the floor for kids to give presentations based on whatever they want sometimes they'll have a theme of pick your favorite conspiracy theory anything that would get kids interested 
uh, in, in actually doing their project. And I, I know for a fact that there are quite a few kids that have given presentations about the idea of a flat earth. And so even just, you know, and getting an A for it, you know, if they're able to articulate it well enough. And I just, I found that so fascinating, you know, um, it's, it, it definitely is, I guess, I guess people could debate as to why it's spreading, but you know, I guess, when they developed the internet to, you know, with the idea of ultimately enslaving people, it's kind of backfired in many ways when it comes to disseminating information very quickly. That brings up a, a question I'd like to ask Rick, and it's, can you speak to the amount of faith which is required to buy into evolution and the heliocentric model and other such theories? I mean, we faith is something that matters to everyone here on this panel. But there is a degree of faith that those who reject scriptures and and a creation account must put in some of these other theories. Well, it goes back to being indoctrinated from the very beginning. Um, if you if you are told the entire time that you are literally from nothing, there was a big bang. You came out of a pre mortal soup. Your uh, you know your great 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 grandfather is uh, you know was a fish. Um, you're obviously not going to understand who he is if that's all you've been given. And the other thing is, too, on this, not to go far off this question, but the the men of the household have stopped teaching the truth. Mm -hmm. They've stopped upholding their responsibility to tell the truth and, and to teach. Uh, and when you get that into a giant group of people or let's say the sea of humanity, uh, you're going to have issues with that when the truth is is ignored. Uh, this is this is why uh, a strong delusion is coming. This is why things are going to happen. But to go back to that, the, the amount of faith that it takes for someone to believe that, um, first of all, they're being shoved off the cliff from day one as soon as they step into that school. Secondly, uh, if they are taught from a pop culture that there is not the God that you think and there's all these different, you know, uh, confusing uh different scenarios and, and, and scripts that are out there. Um, the faith comes right down to this. When you get right down to evolution and what it is, I always ask the person, give me one example where one kind has turned into another kind. When you can show me where macro evolution has actually happened, rather than just a figure of carbon dating and crazy numbers that nobody's been there to observe what it was like back then, and it doesn't even match up anyway when you actually look at it. Um, yeah, the, the faith that it takes to believe what you've been told is actually, I believe, it, it comes with apathy because most people don't care that they've been lied to. And they'd rather believe the lie than actually go out uh, and, and do the research and find out for themselves. We've become very lazy. And I think one of the things that comes down to on that, too, is the scripture that my, you know, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's exactly what I truly believe has happened. But but he's but I do believe he's pouring his spirit out at this time too. That's why we're all talking about this. I five years ago I would have never believed that I was going to be talking about flat Earth. No way, no way would I have thought that. But for some reason, when it came along, I didn't make fun of it either. I didn't make fun of of the guy that you know brought it to me. And I I kind of thought about it. I'm like, you know, I've always looked at that NASA stuff and thought it was kind of you know silly looking. And, and then when I started digging in and going frame by frame and using what I've learned, yeah, it it when you really take a look at what they've given you, it sure as heck does. It takes a lot of faith to believe what they're telling you to be the truth. It takes a lot of faith. But I also know that nobody's going to run to the Father and run to the truth without him putting it on them. I, I, I believe that. I mean, you know, we're supposed to plant seeds and tell the truth in all things and, and be an example and lead people and be gentle and loving as much as we can, but also use our tongue as a sword and tell the truth and be the salt of the earth, not the cotton candy. So when I look at it from the standpoint of, you know, how is it a faith issue? It's an indoctrination indoctrination issue because the faith has been lost in the households to begin with. There, there was, should have been an uprising a long time ago in this country, especially with the public education system. And I don't see it getting any better uh, anytime soon in, in, the, in that realm. I think that the homeschooling side is where you could really put something together for a curriculum 
for parents to uh, do this as they start to understand this using the scriptures and using actual science and the tests that are being done now and the observations that are being done and, and they're fun experiments to go do with your kids and testing the moonlight temperatures and all of it you know uh, looking at the stars and realizing there's no parallax you know polaris is right there you know it, it doesn't move uh, the sun comes up over here and it goes around in a circle that's why it looks this way that's why it looks big on the horizon i mean all these things are so easy to explain but I, but I also know that there's nobody out there doing this yet. That might be something that, you know, Robbie, that's, you know, you got little ones, buddy. I, there's a nudge. There's a nudge. Now with this topic of people all around the world getting this passion and, and a desire to seek out truth, why do you guys think that this is happening at such a unprecedented rate nowadays? Why are people w willing to go online and, and look up something that they wouldn't even give a thought to 10, 15 years ago? Because it's easier. It's easier now. I believe we're the last generation, the fig tree generation, and the spirit is being poured out on all flesh. And, yeah, just like um, Judd said, it is, it's easy. All you have to do is type in whatever keyword, whatever – a topic or issue you want to look into, um, examine more closely from the safe comfort of your own home. You know I mean, you don't even have to get out of your pajamas. You know I mean? Anytime, any day, uh, night, you can search out, seek and discover and find truth and go down any rabbit hole you would like. I mean, it's all uh, accessible. And truth has been so largely hidden from us and kept from the masses for so long and yet now people can put out on web pages on the internet uh, the things that they've discovered the things that they've researched their whole lives things they've never spoken about or shared with anybody else and now you can access all of that uh, from people all over the world and translate it into your own language I mean the knowledge has never been uh, as easily accessible as it is now and so there's really no excuses for ignorance. And if I, you know, if I can add to that, I'll just say this, that, you know, uh, science, the scientism world, you know, has been at war against the faith and the, the church of Jesus Christ, the true Christians, the true born again believers for, you know, hundreds of years now. And it seemed like for the longest time they were, winning and, and pushing things back. And you know, I just believe that, that, and I agree that we are, I believe we are the last generation and God promised there would be an end time revival, even in the midst of a great falling away. I think a lot of religious people, people that have been traditional uh, and stuck in their ruts for a long time are falling away and being deceived while there's a, there's a lot of people waking up. And I think it had to be, you know, in every true revival, and I've studied church history, in every true revival, God either uh, emphasized or restored a truth that had been buried, pushed down, um, or, you know, set aside. I mean, I, I could go through, you know, from from Wesley and to, you know, Finney to the, you know, Pentecostal revival in the early uh, 19, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s to restore the gifts of the spirit to the church. Um, I just believe this is a a move of the Holy Spirit to bring people back to the Bible, back to Jesus, back to faith. And it, it takes something in a time where of such darkness and deception, it takes something as outrageous as this, you know, something like this to really wake, get people's attention and bring them back to look at the Bible. What's cool about that, and I want to share this real quick, those those kids in the class, she she asked all of them if they were Christians, if they went to church, and all of them raised their hand and said, yeah, we're, you know, we're in the South here, we're in Alabama, so you know, everybody goes to church, right? And, uh, but how many of these kids, and I could just tell you, I mean, I could just guess that most of them don't read their Bibles, they don't take things seriously, and, but I guarantee you from that discussion and their teacher saying, yeah, it's flat, I guarantee you those kids went back and started reading their Bibles. So um, I, I just see this as a move of the Holy Spirit to draw people back to the Bible, back to Jesus, back to the Gospels. And, you know, creation is foundational. The creation truth is foundational 
to the scriptures and you know it's just important yeah, i agree yeah i agree and i mean the creation is completely foundational absolutely and when we're looking at this topic i mean we have to understand that you know right from the beginning you know satan has been meddling with it we know in romans that the creation testifies to the true creator so what i'm saying is when it comes down to it when we look at the bible and this is where for me i always tell people i say it's not really about the shape of the earth for me at all anymore it's about can we truly believe what god says in the bible can we take it literal now, the discussion usually gets around, you know, when we take all the things literal and for the sake of argument, if we stick just to creation, you know, people had no problem taking six literal days and, and the age of the earth and all that literally based on the Bible. So what we're saying is applying that method and you throw it across. Why is it being conveyed? Why is it being conveyed that the sun is being ordered to stop would mean that the sun was moving. But yet science says, no, the sun isn't moving. So everything is contradictory to what the Bible says. So before people even get into the shape of the earth, you have to go through it and say, why does God talk about pillars? Why? You know, like you have to understand that we're all, you know, modernized. But what about all those cultures that are reading it? They understood it. Why would God deceive all those generations and confusing them? And they have no clue. The doctrine of accommodation is so dangerous because what it says is God could only work with what he had. Those guys, you know, they it wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't have been able to handle if God said, by the way, this earth is spinning. Yeah, they would. They would have believed God. They would have trusted him in faith. And they would have said, you know what? The Yahweh. Our God, you know, he says the earth moves and all the pagan cultures, they'd all laugh and say, no, 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 no. And he'd say, you know what? We're sticking on faith. We trust God that he says that the earth flies through the heavens like an eagle. I all say jokingly, you know, find even that poetic verse in the Bible that the earth flies through the heavens like an eagle. You can't. And again, one verse would destroy this entire discussion tonight, biblically speaking, if we had it. But there is no verses that convey the earth is moving at all. So I just find it interesting. You know, we're talking in this panel in 2018, yet there has been lots and lots of people throughout time that have read the Bible and have took it at you know, face value and said, why is God saying this? Can I take it? You know, can I take it like a faith, like a child? So I just say this is incredibly important because it comes down to the Bible. And while, you know, a lot of Christians, even myself included, you know, I was holding six day literal creationism, but I had let a lot of steep in where I'm like, well, those pillars, I don't understand that. Well, they just, they believe that the earth, you know, was, you know, uh, you know, it was the universe that was doing this, or I was justifying it based on what scientism had taught me. Again, scientism for me personally had made me go away from God, laugh at the Bible for many years of my life. Cause I'm like, you know, science has already proved that Noah's Ark story is junk science has already proved that they have no idea when it comes to the age of the universe you know science has proved that you know we weren't created literally you know men and women we were actually you know we evolved over you know millions of years but once you started investigating these and finding out these were absolute frauds you know lucy and i mean joe could talk about all the massive amounts of frauds they were trying to do grabbing a bone compiling it we're seeing this completely and again, in Scientism Exposed, you know that quote, which is really staggering. It says in cosmology, you know, if we're off by a factor of one or two or three or four, that's major. But in cosmology, we're off by a factor of 120. That's 120 zeros off. It's the biggest mismatch between science, you know, and reality. So what I'm saying is this topic is incredibly important because the scientists are even admitting we have no clue. Yet they will come out and laugh at us and say, we've got it all figured out. They don't. They've never measured the distance of a star. All this stuff is theoretical. And to me, this is why it's important because, again, you know, until maybe major grade school, we got into evolution. But what did we all spin in kindergarten or grade one? I mean, even in our mobiles, you know, in our cribs, the solar system, that blue ball, you know, the great blue marble. What I'm saying is right from an early age, it's just like Satan to grab the kid at an early age, something that would be so massive and then throw in, you know, these falsehoods of ships, you know, falling over the edge and just make it laughable. And yet when people start realizing that, no, we don't believe there's an edge, you know, that you can fall off. Oh, well, how does it work? You know, and Joe, I know has explained that even at the conference, he was trying to figure out the sun, the moon, and we're all trying to figure these things out. We don't have all the answers, but it's fascinating to go on this journey and saying, can we trust God? And can we see with our own senses? And that's one thing I'll leave off with. Isn't it interesting if you take literal view of the Bible, it falls with your senses. You know what? My senses, I don't detect any emotion. Does any of you on the panel? No. God says it's not, it, the earth is not moving. So what I'm saying is scripture validates our senses that we were given. Everything comes together, but it's science and it's our indoctrination system that teaches us says, no, 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 no. You only feel that. But re in reality, you know, like, uh, like Zen had mentioned, we're actually spinning, you know, faster than the speed of sound, you know, faster than, you know, a bullet. I mean, this is stuff that we need to examine and it's really important. Jared, you wanted to add to that? 
Yeah, if you don't mind, I, just to back up what Robbie was saying, you know, when it comes to this, you know, uh, adoption of the doctrine of accommodation, you know, I was having, um, you know, as frequently we probably all do, you know, have these conversations with people that we know, you know, I happen to be having a conversation with what, somebody I would consider to be an extremely intelligent grad student in seminary. And in the course of this conversation, you know, the topic of flat earth is very frustrating to this person. Uh, and I just started going through all of the examples that Robbie just listed, the sun, the moon, according to the scripture, you know, evolution being taught versus creation being taught in scripture, so on and so forth. The, the, the various list of things that we can, we can talk about, how scientism is the complete opposite of what the scriptures seem to teach over and over and over and over again. And in the course of this conversation, I actually just took a snapshot of the combo. You know, I, I, I just pretty much asked, why are any of these other topics different than this one? You know, why is it, why is it this one that is so, you know, hard to understand? And um, anyway, this person just says, I get it. Having to accept the Bible is inaccurate, but still upholding its authority on spiritual things is awkward for me for sure. You know, and it was this, it was a very honest moment. Is I get it. I really don't know how to rectify you know, and, that, and that's the thing that really bothers me about this idea of the doctrine of accommodation. People act like when we're talking about scientism versus, you know, I would say reality, you know, the real world in which we live in, not this fake perception of it that's being foisted on us. People act like what we're doing is we're raising the literal interpretation of Scripture up above what we know to be true about reality. And that's not the case. What we're saying, which we should, and it makes me feel bad that I didn't all these years. But the problem is, what we read in the literal interpretation of Scripture is matching 100% what we're seeing in reality when we test these things ourselves. The two things aren't contradictory to each other. They don't form a paradox. They're in perfect sync when you go out and test these things for yourself. Nobody's saying, I believe the scripture despite what we know to be true. What we're saying is what we've been taught is a complete lie, and we can take the scripture literally. The scriptures were way ahead of us on this, and people need to wake up to reality. And, of course, we've just been joined by Rob Skiba. How you doing, Rob? Welcome to the panel. Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. And, and I'd like to ask you a question since you just got in here with us. Oh, boy. And it's this concept of what is the difference between indoctrination and education? Well, education allows you to think for yourself, for one thing. You know, I mean, education should be, here's, here's a problem. Okay, let's figure it out. Start thinking about it. Whereas indoctrination is, okay, we're going to tell you how to think. And you're going to have to check the boxes that we have laid out in front of you so you can graduate. You know, your ability to regurgitate the information that they force feed you, in my opinion, is indoctrination as opposed to actually learning and thinking for yourself being education. Now, the next question I wanted to ask is uh, directed towards Zen. And Zen, I, I wanted to ask, why do you believe that the belief that the earth is flat is driving people to study their Bibles more? Well, it's because the knowledge that is coming to light, the truth that is coming to light, has been encoded into the scriptures for thousands of years. And now that we realize that there is no curvature and the earth is not moving, and as the book of Enoch describes in 14 chapters of the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries, he details in very precise manner the motions of the sun and the moon over the course of the months and the years as they move through the gates of heaven back and forth between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, which is what we see and can even calculate and determine over the motions of a year. And the fact that um, the sun is moving and crossing uh, over the equator for the autumnal and the vernal equinox reaching the Tropic of Cancer for the summer solstice, reversing course and moving back down towards the Tropic of Capricorn for the winter solstice. All these things can be calculated, determined, and felt and seen. And so uh, Enoch's description of the very precise motions of the sun, the moon, and the other heavenly luminaries above the face of the earth as he describes it, this is what we experience, uh, even with what um, 
the story in Joshua where he was given the authority to stop the sun and the moon in their order to delay uh, the, the sun going down and to elongate the day uh, and so that they could finish the slaughter of the, the giants in Canaan land. Uh, if it were the earth that was rotating that caused the sun to go down, then you would think that God would give Joshua the power, the authority to stop the earth and the moon. But that's not what we see displayed in the scriptures. Right. Uh, even in the story of Isaiah chapter 38 with regard to the sun going back 10 degrees on the sundial. It, if it were the earth ocean that caused, again, the sun to disappear for setting uh, every night, then the earth would have had to have been reversed in course, moved back enough to, to, to make it go back 10 degrees on the sundial, and then allowed to continue in regular motion. And yet there was no disruption, no earthquakes, no cataclysm, no tsunamis, nothing of the sort. It was just the regular, um, just a continued occurrence of the sun moving in its course above the face of the earth. And so these kind of things, the stories that we see that are related in the scriptures that have been present there for thousands of years, they are confirming the knowledge that all of us are now coming to rediscover and to reassess. And we realize now that we look at and do the real scientific experiments for ourselves, uh, realizing that there's no curvature doing um, laser sightings over several miles or using, uh, as Rob did, and, and going out to the Chicago skyline from uh, and, and Rick from uh, across the Michigan uh, shores and driving out all that way to prove that it's not a mirage. I mean, these kind of things can be uh, realized and, and experimented by people everywhere. You don't have to have a PhD to recognize that there is no curvature. And even the fact that water, the natural properties of water is that it will always um, collect in a basin and will be level no matter what shape the container you put it in. And water will never adhere to the surface of a ball. And so these kind of things are common sense once we realize that we have been lied to and that the indoctrination has been so massive and so the deception so just all pervasive that we have been filtering the scriptures through this brainwashing, this Copernican, Darwinian, heliocentric mindset that science has been foisting on us and uh, has basically sold to us as a faith. It, it really is a religion um what many of the uh, the other individuals that have been fighting against this they call it the priestcraft um individuals like carl schofer which we've been publishing a lot of older books that have now um, been lost to print but individuals like alexander gleason and um and thomas winship all these individuals parallax they have been expounding and um, challenging and debating for hundreds of years the same kind of things that we are now considering. And so, but none of us have ever been taught by our educational systems, by the high schools, by the colleges, that this question had never been um, settled. And so now that we realize that certainly the Earth is not moving at, you know, faster than the speed of sound and um, and that there's no curvature. No matter what the shape is, it is forcing all of us to reconsider all that we've been taught with regard to the whole heliocentric model for universe and world. Now, my next question is for Joe, and um, it, it's in regards to a lot of evidence that seems to go against the mainstream scientific community. And can you speak to the coordinated effort to shut down any dissenting theories or evidence that may contradict the accepted narrative? Why do they do this? Well, 
in uh, 2007 at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology down in Dallas, there was a meeting before the uh, <clears throat> convention itself. Uh, and the convention uh, the conference uh, consists of all these uh, paleontologists getting up and they give a 15 minute talk on whatever they've been working on for however long and their conclusions. <clears throat> they do that all day for three or four days. But before the convention, they had a meeting and <clears throat> they had a PowerPoint and two of the main guys, Paul Serino, which is one of the big uh, fossil guys of the world, they <clears throat> gave a presentation on how to combat the creationist, like we've all got a lot of money and all this stuff. And Paul Serino himself called, he said, I call for a full frontal attack on the creationist. And <clears throat> that year, some of our friends experienced some of that. I went up to him after the conference and I kind of made him stand there and talk to me for a minute. <clears throat> and I, I told him, I says, he also said that nobody should get a grant to study paleontology unless he's subscribed to evolution. I said, well, you know, you've you're got a litmus test there. How can you ever learn anything if you, you're not allowed to investigate things scientifically? And uh, so you got, you know, it's all upside down. You got it all wrong. Just walks away. <clears throat> Another time um, I was on a dig up in Montana. We went over to South Dakota to uh, a, uh, uh, the museum over there at the Black Hills Institute. Paul Serino was the speaker there, and he had just come back from digging up Super Croc, uh, uh, Sarasucos, whatever he calls it, over there in, in uh, Niger. Way out in the desert, these giant crocodiles laying there, pretty much articulated. Uh, <clears throat> you know, lots of swamps and dry deserts. <clears throat> anyway, he's talking about his work over there in Argentina on the Herrerasaurus, the little, little dinosaur. And he said, for 400 feet here, we have... <clears throat> Herrerasauruses, and there's no evolution, no evolutionary change. But we, we know there was. So I'm thinking, like, what, up there in the air, 400, above 400 feet of strata? <clears throat> and he shows these uh, slides of the strata there. It's red, white, red, white, red, white, red, white, all the way to the top. And I, I, said, I said, Paul, uh, you're, uh, the strata over there looks just like the strata here in Wyoming. Flat layer, boom, flat layer for miles and miles and miles. I said, where are your fossil canyons? He just stopped talking and uh, just looked away. <clears throat> so they can't let people know that, yeah, look at the Rocky Mountains when they're turned up on their edge. It's all flat layers. It's flat layers in the uh, Qumran Caves. <clears throat> it's flat layers in China. And that's, uh, that's because they were all laid down in, in, in the flood. The only, thing, the only way you can flood the whole world with flat strata is in a worldwide flood. <clears throat> uh, there are other other uh, things they do that. Uh, there's a book called uh, Slaughter of the Dissidents, and <clears throat> uh, uh, the author cataloged about 200 real scientists with degrees, working in laboratories and major institutions, who made the mistake or had the guts or the integrity to tell their constituents, uh, you know, these dates are bogus or this conclusion is bogus. You know, the science doesn't uphold it. Well, they were fired. Why would you fire them? I thought science was uh, all about open-mindedness, seeking the truth, always reevaluating our positions and all that. No, sir, because what they were bringing up was going to contradict the scientism of evolutionism. And that's, that's just the nature of paleontology and a lot of geology. Now, Joe, you've been a champion for defending the biblical narrative for many, many years, and you've been you know, going after those who are promoting the old earth evolutionary theory, the doctrine of accommodation, and while you were not a flat earther when this film was made, yet you still attended the Flat Earth International Conference in 2017 and were willing to investigate the topic um, I wanted to ask what your thoughts are now, and why were you even willing to give the theory a shot? Well, a lot of what Zen just said, um, you know, that's some pretty uh, uh, cogent stuff there. And any thinking person would look at that and go, you know, hey, I better look at that myself. I got to get this guy's book. You know, how is he backing all this up? Because it it seems to ring true. 
so I, you know, there's a lot that um, uh, the flat earthers are, they're looking at subjects that are verboten. Well, I'm all for that. You know, you can't learn anything if you don't ever question anything. You can't learn if you don't ask, ask questions. And someone who won't give you an answer is not an educator. They're an, indoctrin they're an indoctrinator. So <clears throat> uh, I, I still have some, some serious questions about uh, the earth being flat. However, the reason I really, uh, I, I think when this came up, I said, hey, I'm going to look at this because of the scriptures that talks about the firmaments and the waters above the waters and the firmaments and all that stuff. You know, it just sounds like, wow. Uh, so that's out there. That's out there. 350 billion light years out there. Or, or is it something else? I haven't settled that in my own mind yet. And uh, I'm willing to listen because, you know, you guys Zen, uh, Rob, other guys, uh, Robbie, <clears throat> You know, you're you're looking at some of these issues. Now, your minds may be made up, but uh, you're putting out a lot of stuff there that I think a person needs to needs to look at. If you're going to be open-minded, not everybody's open-minded. Not, not everybody cares to be. Uh, I want to know the truth. And if I'm wrong, hey, that's tough because I'm wrong about a lot of stuff, I'm sure. And I'm not afraid of the truth. And I'm not afraid to say that I think something's not true. You know, it's not a personal affront to anybody. Uh, but uh, if I say I don't agree with something, I want to know why I don't agree. So, you know, there's a lot of good stuff you guys are putting out, and I, I, I'm i encouraging everybody, listen to it. Yeah, I appreciate Danny Faulkner, who's kind of been getting into the weeds with all you guys. Uh, I appreciate the fact that he's willing to continue to discuss it. He's taking a stand. He's trying to defend his stand, and he's willing to come back and meet with everybody. Uh, man, I applaud that. Uh, I think that's great. Uh, you know, look at the Apostle Paul. Everybody would have said, that guy become a Christian? No way. No way. Well, <clears throat> you know, a lot of us strong-minded people, uh, if you just want to be a dictator, then you'll never change your mind because, you know, you're satisfied. Well, not me. I want to know the truth, even if, it, even if I have to swallow a lot of crow. So I hope I won't have to swallow crow, but I'm, I'm willing to look at it. I got a question for you, though, Joe. Like getting off the flat Earth topic, let's just go into geocentrism. Would you say that uh, you know that holds a lot more weight for you right now? Like, would you be leaning more towards geocentrism versus heliocentrism? Because I find that interesting. A lot of people that are really no, I'm not there. I got a lot of questions. They're like, yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty convinced that uh, geocentrism, based on a biblical narrative. Well, I'm I'm have been a I would say a geocentrist for the last thirty years. Uh, I was uh, dialoguing back and forth with the uh, uh, Garrett Bo and, and that the uh, uh, <clears throat> Taco Bray Society. I thought they made a lot of good scientific sense. And everywhere in the Bible, to me, it says the earth is not moving. The sun's moving. The, the, sun, the moon is moving. Uh, the sun sets. The sun rises. The sun went back three degrees. All that sort of stuff. And a lot of my Christian friends have said, that's just... Oh, wait, it got, they, they didn't know how to describe it. They couldn't, didn't know what else to say. Now, I'm going to wait a minute. The scripture is inspired. Every word is God breathed. If God was just as easy for God to say, uh, I'm going to make the earth stop for a minute, or I'm going to make the sun go back, what's harder? Whichever is true, God could say it. So I, you know, uh, some of the stuff Zen said a while ago makes me even more confirmed as a, as a, uh, a geocentrist. Uh, besides that, the heliocentrist tend to be, that tends to get into paganism, you know, the worship of the sun and all that. So that was a red flag for me in itself. <clears throat> now, for those tuning in, um, could you guys explain, uh, for those who don't know, the difference between geocentrism and heliocentrism and why this is scripturally significant? Rob, would you mind jumping on that one? What is what is the difference between those two? Well, just what it sounds like, heliocentric, centered on helios or the sun, versus geocentric, centered on geo or the earth. And all you have to do is open your Bible and read Genesis 1. The earth's here first. <laughs> you know, the, the, the sun doesn't even show up until day four. 
And so, like I say, okay, what was the earth doing for four days waiting for the sun to show up, you know? Um, and like Joe said, it, when, when you do get into heliocentrism, uh, you do find yourself fully immersed in paganism. And a lot of pagan ideas go to the direction of sun worship and things of that nature. Um, you know, one of the things we hear as an argument a lot, well, everything else up there is a sphere, so the earth must be too. And I'm like, well, okay, all the billiard balls are spherical. Does that mean the table is too? No. The, the billiard balls serve a purpose on the table. The sun, moon, and stars, and there's no mention of planets, by the way, in the Bible, serve a function for the earth. They are there for signs and for seasons for the occupants of the earth. So everything about scripture is earth centric. It's all about the earth and this place that God created for us to inhabit. And one of the big things for me, in addition to the firmament, I just tell people, look, just study the firmament. If you claim to believe the Bible and you hold it as your Holy Spirit inspired source for truth, then just do a study on the firmament. And I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Faulkner, but it doesn't just mean expanse of air, gas, and uh, vacuum of space. It doesn't mean that. The Hebrew word rakia comes from a word that, that, that means beaten down, like beaten down metal, like the, the laver in the tabernacle. Uh, Job says the sky is hard. It's firm, like a molten looking glass. Uh, Amos says that, uh, that it's connected to the earth. The, the, and depending on your English translation, the vaulted dome is connected to the earth. We see in numerous places that God's throne is sitting on top of it. The Hebrew word is all about solidity. The Hebrews believed that it was solid. The Greek tr uh, translation in the Septuagint uses the word stereoma, which also is a word that means hard. You know, so over and over and over again, it's talking about hard. So if we're in a circular enclosed world with a firmament on top of it, you know, this is the earth. We're talking about here and the sun moon and stars were put in the firmament and, and that was a huge one for me and then the second really big one for me was realizing that you had isaiah yeshua jesus christ if you prefer peter and john okay four really big people in the scriptures including the son of god himself saying that all the stars are going to fall to this place like figs the heavens are going to burn up all the stars are falling here. So, you know, from Genesis to Revelation, it is very clearly a geocentric uh, text. You know, uh, there's nothing that says the earth is spinning, orbiting, moving in any way whatsoever. And it certainly doesn't indicate in any way that it's going around the sun. So at the bare minimum, if you claim to be a Christian who believes the Bible, you better be a geocentrist, at least. And I say, great, if you're a geocentrist, that's the gateway drug to flat earth anyway. Awesome. You know, be a geocentrist. Just keep going. You got two inches left to walk. Because <laughs> you know, once you cross over there, if you, if you can make it as far as being geocentric and realizing that the Copernican model is false, you have to rethink everything you think you know anyway. Because everything that we've been taught about the cosmos is based on a heliocentric uh, Copernican model. So if you can realize that heliocentricity is false and geocentricity is true, well, you gotta you gotta start over anyway. Well, Paul, the minute you actually bring that up, you've got to look relook at all NASA when they're showing you all these fake CIGs of Earth spinning and stuff. You gotta be like, wait a minute, what's going on? They're completely lying. So then you go into that investigation, finding out well why would they lie and going a lot further. So I agree, and I'm I'm happy. Anytime I hear someone that say I'm geocentric, I'm like, you know what? That pretty much is it. Well, it's pretty much it. It's pretty much it. If you think about, it. like I said, the firmament, that's getting into a whole other discussion. But I bring up, I bring this up a lot of times, but I say the earth as a globe is one of the most dangerous satanic lies ever. And it has so many implications when you say the earth is a planet. Because again, like Robin mentioned, you know, planets are not mentioned. All throughout the ages, they were called the wandering stars. Now I'm going to ask everyone on the panel this question. If throughout the ages, the stars were the wandering, you know, they were the wandering stars, these planets, so-called planets, where in the Bible do you find that the earth was a star, a wandering star? Would you ever say that the earth was a wandering star? No. So then why are we saying the earth is a planet? We know it has to be unique, it's special, completely distinct from everything God created for it. I mean, understand that everything in the sky was for it, illumination, for signs and seasons. The idea that this thing is just like everything else in the sky, 
that is where it trips up most people. And that's why they have the hardest time with this is because the earth is a planet. No, it's not. So that whole earth is not a planet shirt sure, is coming out soon. I'm going to have it because again, it's really important that people understand that the earth is not a planet and going back biblically speaking, the earth has never been a wandering star. Now, the next question I wanted to ask is uh, directed yeah. towards Dean. Back for one something. Oh yeah. Go ahead, Joe. What about the scripture says uh, there are bodies celestial and terrestrial? I actually think that's a, an awesome question because uh, biblically speaking, I just posted something about this on my Facebook page the other day. Uh, biblically speaking, the angels, or the stars are angels. Many times you see the two words are interchangeable. Uh, the host of heaven are, are reference to the heavenly armies of God, okay, that are angelic. They're also a reference to the stars. We see point blank in Revelation chapter 9, and I saw a star fallen from heaven, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit, right? Uh, we see the dragon taking one-third of the stars, and we are so fond of saying that Satan or Lucifer had uh, one-third of the angels followed him, and it's depicted as stars in the book of Revelation. The book of Enoch tells you point blank that the stars are angels. So they're sentient beings. So you have terrestrial beings and you have celestial beings, but the point is that they're sentient. And the other side of it is, as Robbie was saying, that uh, th there is no word for planets in the Bible. And the King James, I think, is the only one of the only English translations, if I'm not mistaken, that actually uses the word planet. And I think it's first or second Kings, I forget which. But if you actually look up the Hebrew word, it's the Maseroth. It's the word we use for um, the constellations or the um, zodiac. Uh, so it's incorrect. And when you look in uh, Jude, it says the wandering stars are reserved for judgment. Well, what do you, why does God need to judge a rock? <laughs> There's no reason to judge a rock or a ball of fire. But if it's a sentient being, and it just so happens that all the ancients worshipped them as sentient beings, and the names of our planets are the names of the gods, well, then it makes a whole lot more sense. What well, we call them rock stars and movie stars now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, stars. <laughs> my next question was for Dean, and it was, what is the significance of taking scripture at face value in regards to the nature of creation as believers? Well, I mean, really, it's just the proper hermeneutics. I mean, the the laws of, of biblical interpretation that most conservative theologians and seminaries even accept. I mean, and I'm, I'm friends with a guy who is a you know, PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary. The guy reads Hebrew and Greek and uh, flat out. I mean, he just says, I, uh, he, he heard my first, some of my first sermons on going through the firmament and the shape of the earth and, and all of this from a biblical cosmology standpoint. And I asked this guy, I said, am I correct hermeneutically? Am I interpreting the scriptures correctly? He said, man, you're my hero. He said, he said, you haven't missed a Hebrew word or a Greek word, just like Rob went through a minute ago. Absolutely, the the words, the literal words, and their context and their historical, grammatical, every across the board, um, it lays it out that it's literal, specifically about creation. I mean, if we if if we're going to say Genesis one is up to interpretation on whether it's literal or or figurative, we are in big trouble. I mean, how, uh, if, if, if that's our hermeneutic, if that's the way we try to interpret the Bible, just anything goes, then, then how do we know that the, the death on G, you know, the atoning death of, of the Messiah on the cross, how is, how is that? Could that be metaphorical? What about his resurrection? I mean, this is very dangerous. You don't get to pick and choose. And uh, the Bible usually is very clear anyway, if it's a parable, or if he says it's, it is like something or as something, or you know, the Bible even uses the term allegory. You know, Paul in Galatians was talking about the allegory of the two covenants. I mean, he says this is an allegory. So he's not leaving it open to private interpretation. Um, and, and it, you know, again, the, the proper hermeneutic is always to take the scripture at face value literally first. And then if there's clarification that there might be some symbolic language or a metaphor, it's possible. And we're not saying that they're not any figurative speech or metaphors in the Bible, but you know, when it comes to something as literal as the real creation, um, the Bible is clear. It, it, and, and, what's, and, and what's beautiful is like, like these guys have said, we can test these things. 
you know, we can actually go out. We've done it. Our church, uh, we've had groups go down to Mobile, Alabama and do 13, 14 miles test across Mobile Bay three times proven it's flat. I mean, you can go out and you can do this just like the scripture said. It says go test all things and and hold fast to that, which is good. So uh, again, it's just proper interpretation. This is why I get so frustrated at Answers in Genesis and Faulkner because they're being dishonest. I mean, their whole article about the firmament is absolute dishonesty. It's they're dishonest to the proper hermeneutics. They're dishonest to the proper definitions of the Hebrew and Greek words. They're just dishonest and it's on purpose. I'm going to tell you it's on purpose now at this point. There's no excuse for that. Why, that why do you think that is, Dean? Why do you think it's on purpose? Because I think they are protecting careers and big donations, frankly. Mm. I think there's something to it. I, I think it's really strange, but Faulkner, I mean, I had a talk with him one time and he wrote this just recently, but he thinks that this whole thing is to make Christians or the Bible look ridiculous. So it's really strange that while, you know, Bill Nye and the rest of the scientism community all, you know, laugh at answers in Genesis and think they're complete morons, they want to hold some sort of dignity in, in when it comes to cosmology. It's like they want to hold on to it and it's like, there's something there. It's almost like, no, we don't want to be laughed at even further. It's like if we even embrace something, you know, we're going to be laughed at even more. It's really strange because it's almost like they think they have some sort of dignity in the scientific circles, which, you know, if you look at the degrees and you look at the education, you know, of all pretty much the faculty at Answers in Genesis, you pretty much see that they all fall, you know, under, you know, science. So what I'm saying is they have to hold some sort of their teaching. It's not like they went to biblical geology or they went to biblical, you know, um, you know, physics. And these were all secular teachings they had a, a, a biblical worldview but like all of us we all had a heliocentric big bang worldview when we look at the bible all of us whether we were exposing science, uh, evolution our whole life we still looked at that earth as a ball we still looked at the planets as the planets the solar system everyone in answers in genesis are heliocentric there is not one person on answers in genesis that are geocentric maybe i'm wrong and joe can maybe you know he can speak on that i don't know of any and Joe, you know, made a good point that really, biblically speaking, you have to be geocentric. That that just is in there. So even if answers in Genesis were at least geocentric, it's one thing. But they completely laugh off geocentrism. So the flat Earth is not really even the issue. The issue is that they don't take the Bible literally when it comes to uh, cosmology. Well, listen, this, this is this insanity. Faulkner goes so far as to say that the Bible doesn't really address cosmology. What 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 is that? What he went that? so far in an article to say that it would be offending. I, I, I have a video on my channel going through this because I couldn't, I mean, I was blown away. But he said it would be insulting to other pagan cultures. It would offend their view of the world if he had a specific model of cosmology. And I was like, these are the guys that are six-day literal creationists, you know, offending everyone. And yet they said that it would not be good for God to offend the Egyptians, it, it says it, like, look up the article, go to my, my uh, video, you can see it, the article's still up, but he, like, went so far as to say it would be, maybe it's not him, but it was someone with Answers in Genesis saying that it would be offensive, it would be offensive to their view of cosmology if he specifically did it. I mean, I had a pastor myself come up to me and saying, there is no specific mention of anything with the mechanics. It's all about the hidden and the truth behind it. So the mechanics and the order is not important. What's important is the message, you know, it's like the underneath layer. But as far as days, when it was, you know, it happened, like for example, you know, the sun, moon and stars being created after the earth, huge problem, right? But these are the ones that like to dismiss it. But even answers in Genesis, you know, well, you know, I don't know if we could take that literal. The, the important part is God created it all. So I think it's very dangerous. And I was surprised when they went so far as to say it would be offensive to the Egyptians and other mm -hmm. cultures if specific cosmology was the, the Jews were going around saying this is truly the universe that God created. It would be offensive. I mean, this is the writing of Answers in Genesis. I was blown away. And I think it was Danny Faulkner. I, I have not heard that. Uh, I mean, why why wouldn't their cosmology offend me? If I'm, you know, uh, I I don't think any nation or any any uh, uh, cultural system. I just can't see them being offended because someone else thinks the sun moves or the sun doesn't move. They would reject the God. It was almost like they would respect, they would like reject the biblical message if they already thought that the cosmology was off. So it was a way of like, it was a way of kind of evangelism that, that if all of a sudden you're coming to them with this way off cosmology, they won't even listen to you. But if you kind of, you know, don't come with any cosmology, 
then they'll listen to you. That's the nature of this article was saying it was a way to basically, wow. you know, be more acceptable, you know, dumb it down a little bit, water it down, but don't even mention it. God wouldn't even have mentioned it because he knew that he wouldn't be able to get his message out as strongly as if he did. Not many people would be listening to him at all. Cause they'd be like, I'm not listening to him at all. And I'm like, this is crazy. Where do, where do you get this biblically? But yet yeah, this is answers in Genesis. So I think they're on a very slippery slope. Um, and so what is their, what is their definition of the, what is their, sorry, Robbie, what is their definition of the firmament then? Uh, I mean, maybe Rob or someone else. Sorry. Yeah, it's just it, it's the it's the usual line that because some English translations render it as expanse, so they'll just say they'll take the position. Yeah, the the universe is expansive. You know, sure, firmament, expanse, air, gas, vacuum. <laughs> when yeah, none of that, the words, <laughs> none of the words, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, or English, even remotely support that definition. No. Right. No, and and here's what's interesting. I I this is true. Now this is uh, I have the email to prove it. Um, but uh, I in a in a sermon I did not too long ago revisiting the firmament. Um, of course, Dr. Faulkner uh, was listening to the message because I got it. He sent an email to somebody who sent it to me, basically correcting me that because I brought up the canopy theory that I know Dr. Carl Ball used to teach, and uh, of that the the firmament was a canopy of water that uh, basically condensed at the flood and it doesn't exist anymore. That was the canopy theory. So I, I included the creationists like AIG in my kind of, this is, you know, they've got their canopy theory. I said, but they have a problem, you know, in the book of Psalms says the water is still up there. So of course, Danny Faulkner was upset because he said answers in Genesis does not believe the canopy theory. And so I went back looking through their website. I can't find what they believe about it. And then it was told me that uh, he kind of believes something about there is water in outer space. And I'm like, okay, where is this water? I thought we're taught by, you know, the science community. There is no water out there. So I, it's, it's really bizarre. What I'm saying is that, that they, they're stumbling over themselves because they, they're trying to, um, I guess they're trying to fit their 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 struggling models in with the you know I don't know it's just it's just bizarre I mean I I, I sit back and go I don't I don't really know what they believe about the firmament. Well, AIG AIG does not subscribe to a uh, canopy, and Carl Ball, uh, at least the last I heard him talk about it, believes in a more or less hydrogen metallic hydrogen covering. I think. He may have changed his position since then, but I've, I've had AIG people tell me they don't believe in the, the canopy theory. Now, there may be more than one, but as far as I know. Well, the next question I had was for Robbie, and it's, you, you know, with this topic of challenging scientism and of a lot of these kind of pre-built up theories and positions, both scripturally and scientifically, what gives someone credibility when it comes to research? Because many of the people you're challenging have degrees and certificates and doctorates and titles. What makes the everyday researcher worth listening to? I was uh, doing an interview the other day and someone asked, they're like, yeah, but uh, you know, nobody was a scientist that's coming to speak on this. Or like, are you, do you have any science background? And I'm like, no, but does Bill Nye, I mean, he's been set up as basically the spokesperson for all things science. Let's get Bill Nye on to talk about climate change or let's talk about dinosaurs or let's talk. And it's the guy's an actor. And I find it funny and hypocritical of them pointing their fingers and saying that we need to have degrees. And yet they have the major spokesperson out there that doesn't even have a degree. He's an actor. So again, there's a double standard going on. And I know there's respectable scientists out there with degrees. It's just interesting that, you know, the media love to use, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye and these names that we know. Um, and, but Bill Nye it makes me chuckle because I'm kind of like, you know, it's funny. He can speak on all things and he has no degrees whatsoever when it comes to, you know, science. But I think when it comes to this discussion, we all can go out and we can be scientists. Really, when it comes to the empirical method, it's about going and doing those experimentations. And like, you know, many on the panel have said, what, what's intriguing about this is the, the reality that God created. You know, go out and test all things. But you can go out. And what I find amazing is it. It backs up your senses. God gave us our senses. Our senses are there for a specific reason. And it just, you know, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever that God would, you know, want to confuse us so much that our senses would have no bearings whatsoever when it comes to creation. Creation is so important to God. He says in Romans that it testifies to the true creator. So it's just like Satan to come in and mess it up 
and muddy it up as much as he can. I mean, it's just like, you know, Satan to do this because he knows that the more people will see the, the, the handprint, the identification of the true creator of creation, he's there. And, and, you know, Satan wants to eradicate that. And he's done an incredible job when it comes to scientism. So I think when it comes to, you know, who, who can speak on this, anybody can start looking this up. And when it comes to the Bible, you know, faith like a child children can read the bible and sometimes they'll get it before we will because they'll be like no but it says this daddy it says pillars like what's going on here right it says the earth doesn't move what's going on so i think really you know the the, the bible is not a science textbook it's not a history textbook it's the word of god it trumps all things we don't need to treat it as a book but it is the authority of all things and really the only authority we need is the bible period now the world system has been set up in such a way that it's the world's wisdom so all these degrees and everything, really, when it comes to, in God's eyes, what does it account for? It, I mean, God has a lot of things to say with the world's wisdom. He says it's foolishness in his eyes. Now, I'm not saying that anyone that has degrees or does these things and they want to honor and glorify God with them, that's wonderful. But what I'm saying is to have this prestige that the world gives for, for you know, letters that under their names and saying they're experts and authorities on these subjects. They're experts and authorities of the system and the world's ways and what they've been taught. When you break out of that and you start reading the Bible, it is clear. It is there. And that's one step at a time, whether it's, you know, coming at it slowly and you've been looking at evolution for a while. And then all of a sudden you start looking at it like, well, wait a minute, maybe the earth's not moving and you get into geocentrism. Again, maybe we're just at the very end of the spectrum. Maybe our personalities, we're ready to look to anything. So I say it's important for everyone just to go on that journey, discovering the truth and understand that the Bible you know, that's the main thing. If you're, you know, on the fence or you just really, you know, you doubt the Bible, you need to come to the understanding or investigate it to the point where you're like, no, I believe this word for word. Once you do, it will change your life because every word you can trust on, every word, jot and tittle is true. Now, this is not to say that there aren't very intelligent people out there that are starting to fall into this belief that the earth is flat. Now, I know, Rick, you know, a lot of the FE core guys um, can you tell us about some of the roster of people out there who are doing this research and looking into the scientific proof of no curvature or or the experiments that are being conducted by very intelligent people? Your mic's muted there, Rick. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> deposit 35 cents uh no with fe core you know the beautiful thing about the organization there is it's a band of people that want answers and just want to go get them um you know there's been a lot of attacks on that group alone and the beautiful thing about that is is no matter what anybody's saying it doesn't it doesn't matter at the end of the day it comes down to the information. It comes down to the tests that are being done. It, it It's not about uh, anything but trying to find the truth and getting the observations and getting the collecting the data. And it's not just FE Core that's doing this. That's the beautiful thing. It's people all over are doing this. I mean, look what just happened down in South America. Um, you know, there's uh, not too long ago, I just saw the video of the guys that were shooting across from Great Britain over to Ireland trying to catch part of Ireland, I believe. So when you look at this in Hawaii, I mean, this is just, these are the, the simplest of simple. I mean, we've pilot X, uh, you know, there's a guy that um, is on Facebook that, you know, he's a pilot. He's literally putting his stuff out on, you know, he's filming while he's in the air and he's showing things. The guy on the cruise ship showing the, the moon on one side and the sun coming up on the other. Uh, you, you just look at, the sun coming through the clouds. I mean, these things are, we all see this stuff every single day, but we've been threatened with ridicule the our entire lives that if you actually look for the answers, you're, you're stupid. And it just, it, 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 to me, it's just like, wow, look at, look at the pressure of just the indoctrination alone. You know, not only are you indoctrinated from the beginning to believe a certain way or fail, but you also get indoctrinated to treat others a certain way if they question the establishment's answer or the the quote unquote experts uh, because they already know the answers. And that's the thing is we have we've gotten away from letting truth being the authority uh, and we've allowed establishments to be the uh, authority of truth and they choose what that truth is. Now, Rob, I wanted to ask you, why is it important to go out and prove something for yourself? You often say, don't take my word for it. Why is that so necessary? 
You know, it's funny when I was interviewed by Nightline, uh, ABC Nightline, the the interviewer, the woman that interviewed me was shocked that I would say, don't believe me. Like <laughs> she like it, she couldn't even wrap her mind around that mentality. And she's like, well, what are you what are you trying to say? It, like you're lying. I'm a liar. Everybody's a liar. Cause I'm like, don't believe anybody go out there and test it. You know, what well, scripture says, test or prove all things. You know, that's, that's my mentality right off the bat is, you know, scripture says it. Okay. But she kept saying, you know, what is that? What, what, are, you, what are you saying? Am I lying? Or I said, no, look, l lying is if you know the truth and you're intentionally deceiving somebody with something other than the truth. But if you've been lied to yourself and you believe a lie yourself, you're not lying. You're just parroting something you believe to be true that's actually false. And so I'm, look, I'm no different than anybody else. I could believe lots of things that are not true. I believe they're true, but don't believe me just because I said it. Go figure it out for yourself, you know? And I, I think it's this mentality, this indoctrination we talked about earlier that has people not thinking for themselves. We are trained to go to school, check the boxes, answer ABC, do what they tell us to do in school. We go to church. We listen to one guy in the front and, you know, you're not allowed to question anything. You know, we've got to like shift all of that, you know, and ultimately in the end, we're going to have to answer for what we have believed and what we've done, you know, when we stand before the creator. So, you know, my prayer is constantly, Father, please, I don't. I don't want to be deceived. And the last thing I want to do is deceive anybody else. So that's one of the reasons why I tell people at the beginning of my lecture, don't believe a thing I say. Look, I believe this. This is what I think. Check it out. Look, look at it for yourself. But I really do believe we need to uh, do our own research. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the shape and nature of the earth, how many of us have tested anything? I mean, realistically. We all sat in the same classrooms looking at that globe in the corner and listened to what they said. And, you know, Joe rightly pointed out that in these creation ministries have done a great job of showing how they have regularly lied to us about paleontology, about geology, about biology. So why in the world am I going to give them a pass on cosmology? You know, and yet we all did. You know, and you got the Kent Hovens of the world and everybody else showing how they have lied about these other sciences, and we can prove that they've lied about these other sciences. So I think this is one of those things that we need to test just as much as the creation ministries have tested the things like paleontology, geology, and biology. I think it's critically important for us to do so. Jared, I wanted to ask you, why is it important for Christians to speak out against science that contradicts the Bible even if they're looked at as crazy by the world at large? Because uh, truth matters, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I don't really think it's that complicated. <laughs> truth matters. And as Christians, we stand up for the truth. We worship God in spirit and truth. Truth matters. You know, I, um, you know, something I was, when Rob and I were hanging out in Dallas not too long ago at the Flat Worth event with Matt Long, you know, I kind of went on a rant about natural theology. You know, people get really upset you know you get all these stupid emails from all these people that just are suffering from this disorder of cognitive dissonance and they want to they want to say well why does this even matter you know why does it matter it's not a salvation issue like salvation issues are the only things you're allowed to talk about and you know my my short answer is natural theology matters natural theology what we can know about god by what he's been made plain to it romans one what he's made plain to us you know and special revelation and in, in natural in you know and special and in, in general revelation when we look at our environment we can learn things about our creator it is really important and science is a means by which we're able to explore the things that he's made so i think more than anything what Christians need to do is stand up for good science, you know, not scientism and help people make the distinction between what is really advantageous and intellectual for somebody and what is just a lie that's being propagated based on, you know, some sort of stupid worldview or agenda. Now, Jared, uh, Robbie told me that during the making of this film, you supposedly came out regarding flat earth and geocentrism in this film. What brought you to this point, and how has it affected you since? Well, let me just say that's led to a lot of gay jokes in my emails, as more and more people seem to be saying that. So let's just preface that. When it comes to my coming out, uh, you know, it's purely in a flat earth sense. 
You know, it's funny. Um, I, you know, yes, pub publicly, I would say I had, I had talked about it publicly before and it was, it was well known within my own circles and people that paid really close attention or watch our channel through the black on a regular basis. People picked up on clues, but as far as coming out publicly, it's just not, you know, not something I was scared to do, but you know, what we primarily do is we work with, you know, victims of satanic ritual abuse. You know, we run around doing deliverance and, uh, I'm a really, really weird Southern Baptist. Um, so, you know, with our stuff, Flat Earth just doesn't come up a lot, you know, publicly. It's not something I was interested in. And plus, you know, when I was looking at Flat Earth, it, it was not really as popular. There weren't as – you didn't have the Zen Garcias and Rob Skibas out there putting in Dean Odles doing all this amazing research and stuff, you know. So there were better people for the job. And I actually – been a great deal of time. Once that kind of took off, people passed by me. They went light years beyond, you know, what I could add to the public arena. So I stuck to what I know and what God called me to do. But, you know, there does come a point where it just, you can't hide, you know, not that I was trying to hide it. It just came up and Robbie said, you know, I was going to talk about the occultic history of NASA, which is something that I talk about a lot. It's one of the reasons why I really got interested in the study of planets prior to me looking at flat Earth. I wouldn't, say it, was coming out, Jared. I wouldn't say it was coming out. It was almost like it just hit you. It was like the question when I was like, you know, okay, but if the moon landing they didn't do, then why would they lie? And you're kind of like, oh my goodness. To hide the earth. Like, like you were just like, it hit you. So it wasn't like a coming out thing. It was almost like the, that last puzzle piece was there that solidified it. It was just, it was funny to see it on camera. It never really made the uh, the film, but it was great just to see kind of you go, wait a minute. Yeah. It's like, it's all yeah, there. It's it all just, yeah. Sense. It's yeah. And I, and I, and I would have to give credit. I think the first, you know, the first person that I, that really struck me would be Matt Powerland. You know, when Matt Powerland was doing his glove videos, I remember the ideas that Matt Powerland put forth about, uh, you know, getting a picture of the ball, you know, having to get that picture of the ball. That, that always kind of resonated with me. But as you really try to tie in these occultic, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and I, as part, part just to kind of wrap this up and give it back to the panel, you know, that, that was the number one thing out of all of this that struck me more than anything was when I realized that NASA was completely founded by Nazis, magicians, and masons. And when you start looking at their alchemical backgrounds, and the idea of, of real alchemy being a, a successful alchemist was able to change a person's perception of reality. That's when it really struck me. That's when it really struck me that we're not dealing with we're not dealing with real science. We're dealing with magic. And part of the magic is being able to change a person's perception of reality. And that is what I saw. And that is what originally freaked me out and woke me up to the reality that I can't trust a single thing that NASA shows me because I might as well be at a David Copperfield show. Yeah, Jared, I just want to uh, bring something up that we talked about at the Flatworth conference as far as uh, magic goes and programming people to think a certain way is you know that there is a programming taking place when when you see the manifestation of a triggering event. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know, I think about this all the time. If I went around making YouTube videos and posting blogs and making websites about the sky is plaid. I'm telling you the sky is plaid. I can prove it. The sky is plaid. Everybody be like, dude's crazy. Nobody would care. They would just say dude's crazy. They wouldn't go completely bat crap, crazy psycho in front of you. Like we see people and, and people who are otherwise very loving, kind, friendly people, old ladies, you know, people who you would never expect to go completely psycho, lose it like you wouldn't believe just for even suggesting you're looking into this topic. Hmm. That It's a triggering. Uh, can you maybe talk about that a little bit? You talked about it. At the, uh, yeah. And, and, I, and I always, sorry, go ahead. Jay. Who said some, did I interrupt somebody? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. And I always tell, I'll tell a quick story real quick because it has to do, you know, when we're dealing with, you know, people that are inside of a coven or coming out of a coven or something like that, depending, you know, without getting into the details of this, this is his own conversation, but you find programming techniques, right? A lot of times within covens and in the occult, you see programming techniques that are used all the time. You see it in marketing, you know, for goodness sakes, in, in pop culture. But one of the things that struck me a long time ago was there are specific rituals that can be done to those that are, you know, prior to the age of 13, where they're, they're ritually abused on a regular basis by somebody that dresses up like stereotypical Jesus, okay? So you'd have a stereotypical Jesus costume. You'd have um, 
uh, somebody that's being abused, they tell that person to call out to Jesus, right? Call out to Jesus to save you. So you have a seven-year-old kid, maybe a five-year-old kid that calls out to Christ in the midst of sexual and physical abuse that's taking place. Christ comes in, right? Stereotypical Jesus comes in, continues to physically abuse the child, sexually abuse the child. Then they then tell this child to call out to the devil. Stereotypical devil comes in, beats Jesus up, cuts the cords off the kid's wrist, frees the kid, cleans the kid up. The kid learns scripture over the years as he's indoctrinated and programmed in this area. Now, this doesn't happen in every circle, but this does happen on a regular basis in many. And what you see is this child ends up knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter what anybody says, if anybody says Jesus loves you, they know for a fact that that's not true because they've experienced the opposite. They know from their personal experience that there is no way that that can be true. So if you have a crit, say this child is, is out, he's free, he's still a part of the coven, but he's living on his own. He goes to college and you have a, you have a campus missionary that says Jesus loves you. You immediately have anger that comes up because you have you have experiences that tie to the abuse. You know that there's no way that's possibly true, even if it's completely opposite. You know, even if it has no basis in reality, that person's experiences prevent them from being able to look at it from an you know from a subjective point of view. And I did a little thought experiment one time. You know, thinking about that, seeing the firewalls that come up. I just asked like 15 people one day. How do you know the Earth's a globe? That's all I did. I just said, how do you know the Earth's a globe? I wasn't going to argue with anybody. I just wanted to see what would happen. Two-thirds of those people instantly became angry. Instantly became angry at the thought. I didn't even tell them anything. I just said, how do you know? And that's when I walked away that day, and I was like, I'm looking at triggering. I'm looking at evidence of programming. And I've seen it. I've seen it on much darker levels. You know, I've seen it on lighter levels, but it's evidence of programming. And that's when I was like, you know, I'm going to have to figure out some form of apologetic that I use when it comes to talking to people because programming doesn't cut it when it comes to actually debating facts. You know, firewalls are completely unhelpful. Now, the next question I had was for Zen uh, Garcia and it was, what is the significance of where we are in creation compared to what is taught in high school classrooms and throughout grade school? What is this concept of cognitive dissonance that we're seeing? Well, I think the most important aspect of coming to discernment on the cosmology is that we recognize that the Most High is very close and that he's not out there having to monitor and to watch over all these multiplicities of worlds and peoples and supposed um, star systems and planetary systems, but that he literally is right above the vaulted dome of the earth and he is watching over and keeping uh, close tabs on everything that happens here on the earth. And with, with the cognitive dissonance, the ever-expanding universe it foments the ideology that uh, God is too busy with just the expanse of creation, that there's so much going on that really, even with his angelic hierarchy, that he's not closely monitoring all that is going on here. And so people think that because of that disconnection, there's no repercussions to their actions and to their behaviors and that there may not even be judgment and the whole thing with the copernican heliocentric the darwinian is that they have established um doubt in everybody's mind as to whether there is even a god at all whether there is a most high that created everything and that made it in his image that humans are special that the earth is special and because of that doubt uh and because everybody thinks now because of the evolutionary model taught in schools that we somehow evolved of monkeys that uh, there's this total disconnect and the kids that are growing up in this educational brainwashing this indoctrination they are so separate and so wayward lost and astray that it takes them uh, forever long to ever get back on a track to where they even seek out a, a deeper understanding and a relationship with the Most High and with the creation. And they 
not only are they lost spiritually, but they don't even understand how the creation works. And it wasn't until I embraced the uh, the fact that it's not the earth is a foundation for the um, firmament established above it, the luminaries placed within that firmament, understanding that it was the sun and the moon and the other luminaries moving above the face of the earth and understanding how that movement occurs, that I was then able to make sense of the calendar systems that Enoch speaks about with the the lunisolar calendar, the solar calendar, 364 days, and how the sun moves back and forth between the tropics and um, how crossing over the equator we have the 12 hours equal of day and night and, uh, you know, the summer solstice, uh, the winter solstice, all these things and how it ties together with even the lunar calendar and the phases and the movements of the of the moon and how that creates the determination for even uh, Shabbat and the feast days, all these things. And so now when I step outside of my door and I go out and I'm immersed in the creation, um, I'm not lost. I can look at where the sun is, where the moon is, and I can determine direction at night looking where Polaris is, it being the one fixed star of the celestial night. I understand that that is north and that is the center of the vaulted dome. And so I understand my place in the creation and I have a deeper, more profound, intimate relationship with the creator. And I know that he is right above Polaris looking down on all of this. And so having that intimacy restored, it it just brings um, comfort, a closer connection. And I understand also that there are repercussions to everything that we do and that the Darwinian Copernican heliocentric model, it is the one thing that has led so many people astray. And so for those people that are out there and that say that this is not an important issue and that this is just causing division amongst the brethren, really they don't understand the profundity of this issue and how it has the power and the capacity to bring people back to understanding uh, and to understanding that the Bible is inspired, that it truly is the word of God and that you can look to it for answer, not on just the cosmology, but on anything else that you might have an inquisitive mind to come to learn and to understand. And of course, salvation through Christ is the most important and critical issue of that. Um, and the prophecies which are laid out of his coming and his return, all of that also is prophetically encoded into the scriptures, just like the cosmology. And so understanding that these truths are there, people can really go to find answers on so much that is very important. And there's nothing more important than our eternity, our inheritance uh, through Christ and the salvation through Christ. And so hopefully understanding that the answers on the cosmology, all the lies and the deception, are, can be cleared away by just studying the Bible, just studying the Genesis narrative, um, that you can really come to a, a deeper, again, more profound relationship with the creation and with the creator. And it can lead those that are lost, the children of this generation, those that are, have been militant atheists because of their uh, in, upbringing through the educational systems, that the people that are finding the truth uh, and that are seeking them, that they can really be brought to greater discernment on understanding on what is real and what isn't, and that the whole foundation with NASA and the deceptions, all those things, there's a greater reason and purpose for that. All that is rooted in Isaiah 14, the where Lucifer declares himself as wanting to be like the Most High that the whole counterfeit cosmology, the calendar system, uh, the pagan feast days, all the things that we have been led astray into idolatry and that the world is embracing, uh, all of that becomes clear when you understand that even the alien, the ancient alien deception, which I believe is the next aspect of the grand delusion, the strong delusion, that all of that also is based upon these deceptions, the Darwinian, Copernican, 
heliocentric model and that this has served the purpose of the new world order uh, and it will be the next stage of even unveiling an alien god and that these extraterrestrials that are supposedly from way out there some other planet and that they're coming to save us from ourselves that also is part of this grand deception and you know the bible warns us and tells us that because people have no love of the truth that they will bend the knee and that they will accept an alien god as you know the antichrist as a uh, the false messiah and that's right on the horizon that's what we're dealing with that's the end game and so it's important for people to come to realization on this because that's what they'll be facing even now in this day and age now dean why do you believe society is so adamant about removing god from the school system well that's really what zen was talking about we're moving toward a time when the spirit of antichrist is going to take over the world and I, we're really watching from the youth all the way up to the politicians across the board the spirit of antichrist is really possessing people and so it's it, you know the demons and the fallen angels and everything that's going on they're they're really preparing mankind for this end game for this final to accept to accept the false promises of peace from this coming world leader um and i do believe and and have talked about this often that this uh this whole alien uh agenda and deception is it's it's really satan has has worked really hard for this end game i mean he's, he's put the pieces together real good with it scientism with the heliocentric model i mean he's worked this in he he knew he had a short time he started working you know centuries ago so he could deceive mankind and get mankind to worship him to worship his man the antichrist and the whole system and uh so that people would ultimately take the mark of the beast worship the beast and and be damned i mean that's that's his goal to take people away from jesus christ and from the bible that's that's what this whole thing's about and it's multifaceted but it's taking us to this in time scenario that's coming quickly and um it's it's really just a spirit that's taking over people uh, you know zen was referring to second thessalonians too it says those who do not truly love the truth with all of their heart love what the scriptures say above what any man says you know let god be true let every man be a liar the people who don't love the truth of god's word he said god himself will send this strong delusion so we're seeing this delusion but basically the lord is allowing these demonic forces to just go and take people over and that's why too and we're talking i agree with um other brother there talking about the triggering and the uh the programming but that triggering that programming and all that stuff that it's just it's opened the door for demons and these demons are controlling people you see so many people getting into meditation and yoga and all these things it's all the setup so demon spirits can get these footholds in people and they'll be easily led into submission to the coming world government and the beast and um it's 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 scary but you know again the truth of biblical cosmology and flat earth is a weapon against that and and you know not saying it's all going to happen but at least we have another great tool of evangelism in these last days to to tr try to defeat that deception now this next question is for rob and it is how does the media we consume influence our worldview and how is science fiction in general prepping people for a great deception like what we see in some of i know your favorite and my favorite shows like star wars and and star trek and all that oh the enemy has used that medium probably more than any other i would say to advance his agenda um you know the, one of the things you know, science fiction is, as a genre is my preferred genre. It's, you know, it's something I really enjoy. And a lot of people share that enjoyment of that particular genre. But you go into science fiction suspending your disbelief. You know that you're going into science fiction, so you, sus you suspend your disbelief. And that means if you suspend your disbelief, then your disbelief filter has been turned off, which therefore means you're open to believing whatever the filmmakers want to show you. 
And, you know, usually it's done with a pretty decent budget and some amazing special effects. And, you know, the, the stories are good. And you're like, wow, that was awesome. I mean, as a seven-year-old kid sitting in that theater when that Star Destroyer came over and just kept going and going and going and going and the opening sequence of Star Wars, man, I was hooked, you know, and most of us were. And the, the whole rest of the movie plays out. We're like, yeah, you know, I want to be Luke Skywalker. You know, you watch Star Trek. Yeah, I want to go where no man has gone before, which has a whole new meaning for me now, by the way. <laughs> no man has gone anywhere before. <laughs> um, but, I mean, these shows, I mean, look, we're all walking around with our own little tricorder now, right? I mean, they've, they have influenced culture. Uh, and, and many a scientist and astronaut and physicist and whatnot will credit a show like Star Trek, for instance, for being their inspiration for why they they're doing what they're doing. So it's an incredibly powerful thing. And, you know, and my personal opinion on this is that the church has um, not done a very good job of leveraging one of the most powerful things in influencing our culture. And that is the media uh, media arts and entertainment um, have had a huge impact on our culture. Just to give you a little example of that, I was a missionary for six and a half years, been to about a dozen countries, and it didn't matter where I was. I could be in Northeast India where houses on stilts. People are walking around with Star Wars t-shirts on, right? You could, you could say through interpretation, where does the phrase, may the force be with you, come from? And they all know it. You know, ask them John 3, 16, they're, you know, you know completely clueless. So, you know, it's extremely powerful. And, you know, as a filmmaker myself, and I'm just, my ambition is to create some powerful media that will actually spread the truth. Uh, you know, I analyze films and movies and TV shows, you know, like, okay, how has the enemy been successful at deceiving us? You know, how did they do it? Why do I even like the shows that I like, you know, and trying to figure these things out? Well, I've become keenly aware of things, even more so now as a result of getting into this cosmological worldview of how we have been deceived. And there's a show that just recently came out, a Netflix original called uh, The Titan, which the title alone is rather interesting, but uh, it's all about, we need to get, you know, this is in the future. It's like 2048, 2050, something like that in the future. So not too distant future. Uh, but the earth has got like 10 billion people and that's the big thing, right? Everybody's trying to tell us that the earth is overpopulated. No, it's not. You can fit the entire population of the world in Texas. Okay. There's plenty of room on this earth. God knew what he was doing. You know, this isn't catching him by surprise, but the, there's two things that we are being deceived with. And one is that it's overpopulated. So people are the problem. And two, and, and to some degree, it's true. We have destroyed this place and continue to destroy this place. So therefore, because we've destroyed our home and there's too many people here, we need to get off of it. We got to go to Mars, or in this case, in the movie, we got to go to the planet Titan. Well, guess, or the moon Titan of Saturn. Well, guess what? You know, Titan's not a, a place that humans can live on. So, what's the solution? Well, we need to alter ourselves instead of trying to spend lots of money on figuring out how to terraform these other worlds. We just need to geoengineer ourselves to be able to breathe methane, you know, for example, and to live in the hostile environment of Titan. So the, the whole movie is about them genetically altering people to be able to go live in the stars. And there was a presentation that Robbie Davidson did with me uh, when we did the uh, Back to the Future conference. I don't remember if it was called Back to the Future conference, but the one we did in Austin. And Robbie was making the point of, you know, yes, the Bible does say that the angels are stars. The stars are angels. They're sentient beings. Well, what are we we're all about? Let's go to the stars. And we are stardust, by the way, you know, according to the evolutionary model, we are the, a product of the stars. Uh, Lawrence Krauss said, forget Jesus. The stars died so that we could exist, right? Um, so on the one hand, we're being told that star, we come from stars. And on the other, we're, we have to go to the stars. Well, we know that the wandering stars are reserved for judgment. We know that one third of the stars are being cast to the earth uh, with Satan. They're in league with Satan. So how interesting that we are being sold through science fiction primarily, this idea that we need to get to the stars. We need, and, and by the way, movie stars, everybody wants to be a star. We got to get our star on Hollywood Boulevard. It's all about the stars. 
forget the creator, right? The creator are now the stars and the stars are the fallen angels and the gods of antiquity. Uh, I think it's very dangerous what has happened. And, you know, we need to be very cautious about what we're allowing ourselves to be indoctrinated by, you know, and some of this stuff is, it seems very innocent, but, you know, look, I'm a guy who's been watching science fiction. I'm 48 years old. I've been watching it forever, my, my whole life. You know, it's had a big impact on me. And one of the reasons I didn't want to let go of my spinning ball, you know, the earth was because I had been so in love with science fiction and I wanted science fiction and all that stuff to be true. Right. Well, it's not. And, you know, this whole idea of, oh, by the way, we, God didn't do a good enough job on us. We need to alter ourselves. That's Genesis 6. That's the Nephilim. If you look at Genesis 6, 12, it said earth and all flesh had become corrupted. And the result of that was violence. People had only violence continually in their heart and mind. Well, sure enough, in that movie, again, Hollywood gets it. They start altering people. And one of the byproducts is they have tremendous violence. So they have to alter their brains to turn off the violent side of it. So here in this movie, you have people trying to alter the creation that God did of ourselves as human beings in order to go be one with the stars. You know, because Earth is not good enough. Uh, it's I, why I heard before I got on the air here. I had you guys on my phone. I was listening to you. Why is this coming up now? Why of all times, 21st century? Why, why 2015 to, through 2018? Why are we talking about flat Earth of all things? Well, you know, all around the world, UFO sightings are increasing, exponentially increasing. We've got an ambassador to aliens in the United Nation. We got the Pope saying, yeah, or the, you know, somebody from the Vatican saying, yeah, when they show up, we'll baptize them, dot, 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 if they need it. Yeah. You know? So we are, something is coming. I am convinced something is coming in the very near future where everybody's crying out for disclosure and, and you know, all this thing about aliens are coming. They may already be here. You know, they're just waiting for the right time for the unveiling. It's all at one big, massively huge setup that, that took the spinning heliocentric globular earth and an ever expanding universe model to even be remotely accepted. But after 500 years of that being pushed and, and Star Trek and Star Wars and everything else, you know, think of the movie independence day right look go back to war of the worlds war of the worlds they do this radio show and everybody freaks out i think that was a psyop everybody freaks out oh okay so we're not ready for aliens yet let's spend all the 50s 1950s putting out one b movie after another of science fiction again the 60s star trek star wars 70s we're indoctrinated then by the time you get to independence day they're on the roof of the building with signs take me take me right before the spaceship opens up and blows everything up you know we went from terror at the thought of aliens to take me i want to go and and that's where we're we're at right now and this cosmological worldview that we're talking about here obliterates all of that it destroys evolution it and it, it makes the whole idea of ancient aliens completely nullified it humbles science fiction really quick it's hard to enjoy it now <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Well, and that's just it, and and that is true. I do believe. It. I mean, and it's not just the movies; it's in the music videos. I mean, the the video that always comes back to me is Katy Perry's uh, "Extraterrestrial." Oh man! You know, I mean, and the little girl singing along with that is saying, yeah. you know, yes. take me." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, I mean, <laughs> sleep paralysis is not a fun thing to go through. Uh, talk to anybody that's had it. And, and, you know, literally the, the, the fear that can come over a person uh, when something like that happens on that spiritual warfare side, if they don't, if they're not crying out to the father in Yeshua's name and Jesus name, um, I, I, you know, enjoy the merry-go-round because that's what it's going to be. You might end up back where you were, but it's going to be a wild ride uh, of not being able to move and some of the things that go that goes on there. And, you know, the enemy is not invisible. That's what we have to remember. The enemy that we're facing in scientism is not invisible. It's in our face every day. And it's 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 anything that's not the truth. It's anything that's not the truth. You can see the lies that are out there. You can pick them apart. But like you said, Rob, when you start seeing Star Trek and Star Wars and, you know, who didn't want to have a Wookiee as a best friend as a kid or E.T. sitting in a milk crate on their handlebars? I mean... <laughs> 
right. you know, they, they make us want that. And, and, um, you know, those things become our idols. And, and, and I believe it's in Jeremiah 50 or 51. I think it says that I, I think, I think, but I think it's, uh, they'll be mad upon their idols. They'll go crazy. They're going to go crazy over this stuff. And, and we're there. And I'll tell you the other thing it's got that, that that's coming is the VR. This VR stuff. I actually put some goggles on the other day and in, in, in this place, this cafe that you could go to. And I'm telling you, when I put this on, I felt like I was the lawnmower man. I mean, I literally it's it's like it changed everything. Literally changed, and I'm not kidding. I can't I I can't explain. I stood there and I could look up, and this is just on a menu screen, but I could look up and I could actually see the constellations and the stars. And as I went real fast, it was like the dome had to catch up to where I was going. It was, it was just the weirdest thing. So the technology and the, the strong delusion and everything that's coming uh, with the technology, remember they're 25 to 50 years ahead of us in technology. So holographics things to, uh, you know, radio waves to hearing voices right next to you. I don't know if you guys ever saw that. Um, experiment that they did with the billboards that they could shoot audio down and people could think that somebody was whispering right in their ear the way that they know how to control audio i mean this isn't a joke i mean this is really i mean you've got pop stars reappearing on stage and, and performing and uh you know looking exactly like they're they're, they're there uh, this is the type of stuff that people better understand the deception that's coming we're being set up uh and we've asked for it and and we've it's not our parents' fault. It's not our grandparents' fault. This has been something that's been going on for quite some time. And it's been a process. And like you said, it took them a while to get us to go, okay, I'm not afraid of Bigfoot anymore. I want him to be my friend. I, you know, I want this uh, Wookiee. I want this Ewok. I want this. I want that. I want to be Will, Ro you know, Robinson, you know, with the robot. You know, I, how cool would that be, that lifestyle, rather than looking at what we've got right in front of us and going, what's my neighbor need? It seems to me what you're saying is really important that God is pushing people to have a hunger and a de desire for truth today and now because in a few years, there's not going to be that ability to discern between reality and virtual reality. And what you're talking about with the goggles, just wait until every screen around you, they can make it catered to you. And every bit of information you read on the internet is tailored to you and your profile and what they think you need to understand and comprehend. And being able to draw that line between reality and fiction is... They're I already doing that with advertising. They can follow you. They can phantom you, your IP address. Oh, yeah. With just Google ads alone. You know, I've got Google ads because I, you know, I've been getting a fair amount of traffic on some of my websites and somebody a while back approached me and said dude, why aren't you monetizing that? I mean, you could benefit from this traffic. I mean, you put, you put a lot of hard work into it. Why not? I'm like, okay, yeah. So I look into getting a, a Google AdSense account. And basically all it is, is one little line of code that you put wherever you want the ad to appear on your website. It just says, okay, I want to put an ad on this side of my website. So you just put this little line of code that basically says, put an ad here. That's all it is. And hmm. then somebody uh, contacted me and went crazy on me like you say you're a christian blah 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 and you get all this pornographic ads all over your website and i'm like oh. uh no i don't dude you just incriminated yourself because all i have is a little line of code that says put an ad here and google looks at your browsing habits and caters the ads to you so, <laughs> <laughs> you just busted yourself buddy <laughs> that's actually funny Shouldn't laugh at that, but it's kind of funny. Well, it, yeah, it's funny and it's scary at the same time because we are, you know, big brothers definitely watching. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just it, man. I mean, you know, to sum all this up with scientism, I think, Robbie, not to speak for you, but, you know, I got tired of it. You know, I was so thankful when you asked me to be a part of it because I'm like, yeah, I just, you know it's so true. I mean, I look back and has, here's my question, not to change subjects here, but has anybody ever gone back and talked to one of your science teachers yet? <laughs> no, anybody? <I'm> <laughs> Mine are all good. <laughs> that too goes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry about that. But yeah, no, I, I've thought about that. I'm like, show up and go, Hey, you remember that, uh, remember that thing that happened in seventh grade? Hey, Rick. See my shirt? Sounds like a video. Project. Yes, it's not a shirt? mirage. It's, it's not, not a mirage. mirage. <laughs> that, 
I, I actually didn't plan that for this interview. I, I had that's hilarious. I wore it to my gym, but it, it does bring up a lot of interesting conversation. It does. What's, what does that mean? Chicago's not a mirage. Mirage that usually starts with. Do you know what cognitive dissonance is? <laughs> we'll yeah. start with that yeah. and go from there. <laughs> you know, Rick, uh, you have an awesome testimony of how God has confirmed for you just personally about this whole concept of a flat earth and, and it has drawn you into really having a passion and a zeal for it. Yeah. Would you mind sharing what that, what that story was? Well, uh, yeah. Um, condensed version rob called me one day uh, after i'd seen some of this stuff going on but it was basically rob just called and said have you looked into this flat earth stuff and i just said i've seen it but no i, I mean i haven't looked into it and i said why is there something to it and he went, well i was like uh oh <laughs> i'm like what's that mean <laughs> but i didn't i didn't laugh and i'm like I, okay so he told me to watch mark Sargent's stuff and i watched it and i think by the third video out there i think they were only like nine minutes a piece or something but by the third one i was calling the number i'm like all right man you got me hooked what's going on here and i wanted to share with them I'm like i've seen chicago across lake michigan my whole life and then i called rob and he had something going on that day but i got a hold of him later i'm like dude i gotta tell you i i've seen chicago across lake michigan my whole life you know on the days that it's not real humid and he's like no way i'm like yeah i'm serious and you know what was it a, over a year later? I think uh, we got to do the Mirage test. So um, the Mirage test was one thing. The other thing was I, uh, you know, I literally took this whole questioning of our reality to God and creation. And I learned, you know, just in my life to literally go to him in complete humility with a uh, childlike faith that he'll give an answer. And I do believe that he does that. I don't think that he does it the same way every time for the same people or anything like that. I think it's all designed for a purpose and for his time. And um, it was literally, the, it was not to call Rob out on this, but, you know, this was when he was, you know, he was going through a tough time and getting attacked. And he was like, I'm pulling everything down, this and that. And I, I called him that day and I, I, uh, I was like, look, man you know, you can't quit. You can't quit. You know, you got to just keep on going. I mean, you, you've woke, you're going to wake a lot of people up with this. I'm telling you, I've already had people. I mean, just because the attacks, just from actually telling people I was looking at it, I realized I'm like, there's something about this. I mean, this, the spirit that was attached to this was, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, you just mentioned it and you're like, oh, you're an idiot. Blah. I mean, just, just wow. So I was just like, Rob, you can't quit. And right after I hung up with him, like, he was like, all right, man, I got, I got to go. He's like, I, I got to get going. I'm like, okay, cool. Just don't quit, man. And I walked outside and the whole thing that happened, if you guys saw the, the video, but I had been asking God for confirmation. I'd been, you know, looking in this diligently, looking in the scriptures and the scriptures. I'm like, the firmament, the firmament, the firmament. And I kept having this idea about the waters being separated. The waters up top are different than the waters below because the waters below, I th I, I'm like, did he bring the earth? Did he extract the minerals from the water? And that's what the continents are made out of. So the water above still has all that mineral, the minerals in it. That's the land here. I mean, just all this stuff was going through my head. So I'm like, just shut up and just be quiet about it and just take it to prayer. And so that's what I started doing for a couple of days. And I'm like, I can't listen to what everybody else is saying. I, I'm just going to go by what I saw as a kid. And I knew that I could see across Lake Michigan that the water was flat. There's no other way that you could describe it. And next thing you know, I go outside and there was a, a, a box that I had taken from my grandmother's garage. It was sitting there in my dry, in my, on my front porch for a week before I even did anything with it. And it, it was something I had to get from my grandma's. And when Rob first introduced me to this, I told them about me getting kicked out of class as a kid for telling a teacher that I could see across Chicago. And the reason why I'm giving you that whole story is because the video is actually on YouTube. I never explained what the papers were and why I wanted those papers because I just wanted to see what we got indoctrinated with. But when that to, to and I know I screwed this whole story up, but when I opened up the box that was on my front porch right after talking to Rob that day of him having a tough day, there was this folder in this box that was actually from middle school and it had every single thing in there and I couldn't believe that it was there. I'm like, no way. This is the exact same stuff I was talking to Rob about that would be the coolest thing to be able to see what I was indoctrinated with, like literally tangible pieces of paper that looked like they just came out of my locker. 
And I was so like thrown back by it that I went in and I grabbed my phone. And on on my phone, I'm looking down. I put the, the paper down on the ground and I'm looking down and my daughter came out and sat next to me. And this is, sorry, this is so long-winded, but bear with me. When I put the phone down, that's when I was going through the papers. And the, the first question, the very first question as I after I started recording the video, on the, on the sheet, there was a paragraph of information that they give you with the middle school kids. And then you got the questions at the end. And the question, the very first question was, what were the early ideas of the shape of the earth? And I read that and I said this and I said, in my own writing, it says the earth was flat. And just as my lips uttered in flat, lightning struck right in front of my house. Literally struck in front of my house. And right as I hit record of that video at the beginning that I said, I've been asking God for confirmation. I didn't need a, I didn't need a witness. My daughter was there. I didn't need a witness. Everybody that saw it, you either can understand who controls the lightning and the thunder, or you could end up having, you could end up having somebody else come to you that proclaims the believe the truth that hates the geocentric design of the creator. And then they'll accuse you that you're with Satan because lightning crashed down in front of your house because Satan fell like lightning. That's the type of stuff that, that goes on. There's, there's this, there's this banter back and forth that when you see this, I, I, that's why I said, I just take a step back. You can tell who hasn't looked at it. You can tell who hasn't taken a step back and said, okay, God, let me see this. Give me the, give me the, give me this. And it's on his time. And, and, and Rob, I remember you said this to me one time. You said, dude, I, di I didn't get the lightning strike. I'm like, you, yeah, you're right. I can't, I can't expect anybody to, to experience that. But at the same time, I get, you know, uh, emails and people that ran into me at the flat earth conference, dude, that was, the, that's what got me. That was one of the things was like, Oh my gosh, Rob Baxter says it all the time. That was the thing that got me when I saw that I knew like something happened to me at my house. Like, Oh my gosh, that was real. And you know, my daughter saw it. I mean, I didn't get, I wish I could have, I didn't get to see the bolt of lightning. I saw the flash cause I was looking straight down and I thought my phone went off. My flash went off at first. And when my daughter said it, and then when the thunder hit, that's when I knew I'm like, that is, and that to, to this day, that is the loudest thunder I've ever heard in my life. And the, and I've never felt thunder move my house like that. Like literally shook what we were sitting on my chair. I felt the vibration. It was that loud. The birds quit chirping everything. And, the, and I, like I said, from that one experience, Jake, to answer your question in the longest answer ever is how does it, how did it affect my faith? It made me realize how close he is, not just in the scriptures, but in spirit and in mind and in heart, because by him doing what he did, I literally have had people come to me and say, that hit me, that got me, that made me go, wait a minute, what? And they started looking into the scriptures and, and that alone, like I said, I've got nothing to gain by telling this story over and over, but if people can see that and see that tangible that God will give answers and he does it all the time, it's already there and it's already written down. Um, so I, I can honestly say that my faith has grown exponential because it makes me realize, you know, every time I see them lying, it backs up the scriptures that that's exactly what they're going to do. So no matter what, you know, it's a win-win for us because we stand in the truth and, and you know, we're going to be hated for it. Thank you for sharing that, Rick. It's it's an awesome story. Sorry, man. I I know it was long winded, but it 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 was it it did it changed everything every bit of the perspective that I had, and it made me realize how real and 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 dear and close that he is, and how much more intimate of a design that it is for us. I mean, he made something really. I mean, he can keep an eye on us at all times, you know, and and, and just like I said, there's he's it's not some random accident that happened so far away and so long ago that we can't, you know, wrap our mind around it. And, and it's just numbers and it's just meaningless. This is real. This is tangible. It's like, like I said, or somebody said earlier, you know, when, when this, this is removing so many veils in so many aspects in so many ways that, that all it takes is that person to get into those scriptures. And once they start reading this stuff and going, wait a minute, what else is there? And before they know it, they they the, the word of God will resonate with them. It's alive. And I believe that. And he's using this to bring people in and get closer just by reading the word and looking at it from the scientific side. Then they start looking at the historical side. 
then they start looking at the relationship side and understanding the wisdom that's in the word. And then they start realizing that they become a new creature. Then they next thing you know, they're saying stuff that they thought was crazy one day <laughs> back in the day. So it is life changing. Robbie, how did you hope to impact people with this film, Scientism Exposed 2? And, and what will your next film be about? Well, really, the big thing was when I came up with Scientism Exposed, it was all about you know coming to this topic, whether it was geocentrism or it was coming to flat earth, and really not mentioning those words. Really, if, the, if you look at the first one, even into the second one, other than you know, Pastor Dean reading a NASA article, um, you know, a document, Flat Earth isn't even mentioned. So what I wanted to do is to come up with something to get people really questioning things, just looking into things, whether it was the lies of evolution, whether it was the lies of, you know, um, space agencies with NASA or anything. Because to me, it was important just to, you know, look at your world, but then also, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. Wait, we supposedly went to the moon, which they say is a quarter of a million miles in the 60s and 70s. And yet since then, the furthest that we can get is 50, is 400 miles. Like that, that's weird. So it was to present this information to get people questioning. Because again, when you get into these topics, it really is hard for people to understand. It's like, well, why would they lie? You're going to hear it all the time. And we've, we've got into it. And, it, and people that haven't seen Scientism Exposed too, it really gets put together. You know, why would they lie? And you kind of see not only the framework of how, you know, as Rob was, was mentioning, you know, and others with the alien deception, I always say that the whole of these deceptions, whether it's evolution or whether it's the globe lie or whether it's the universe, all of these are in place, not as a, the end itself. They're a means to an end. Satan puts them in place to basically, you know, create what he needs to, to have, you know, happen. So it's not just to prepare the world for what's to come, but also to give the world the narrative in banning the world together to make war with God. I think that's one of the biggest things and scientists exposed to really brings that together to really answer the question, well, why would they lie? Because it needs to be in place, not only to, to believe for it to be believable, but also for us to, you know, understand that we've got this really, you know, massive enemy that's out there and we need to band together and we need to make war. Like, having them come and being our friends, like Rob had said, the escalation of, oh my goodness, freaking out with aliens to, you know, take me up. Um, you know, they'll come with all signs and wonders, but being friendly and I think that's really, you know, a big part of this deception. So, when you can kind of understand how it's the framework is being put in place, but also, you know, these topics, when you hear the two words, flat earth, it turns off everyone. We've already gone through how it brings out the inner cycle <laughs> person, like Rob says all the time. You want to see the inner cycle when someone mentioned those two words. It could be grandma. Hey, grandma. Hey, I'm looking at the flat earth. Blah, blah, you know, and she's been like friendly her whole life and passive. And then she just loses her mind. You know, something's going on because grandma's never flipped out. But then you say, grandma, I kind of want to, you know, you know, when you're in the library, can you get a book uh, for me? Well, what's it on? Oh, it's uh, on flat earth. Ah, and she freaks out. So again, there's these reactions that are taking place. So to have materials, and again, scientism exposed was really important for people that really want to get this message out to people. They don't know how to bring it up with their family or friend. So in a non-threatening way, you can present the information without even mentioning those two words. Like if you watch Scientism Exposed or even the sequel, you'll see how it gets really deep into stuff and it really gets into the lives of scientism. Because when people understand that most of their life they've been holding on to scientism instead of true science, because I think that's the biggest thing. It's like science is truth. It's reality. And it's a very scary thing. It's like, you know, holding on to that ball. If that's all you knew your whole life and someone wants to take it away from you, you're defensive, right? So there's a psycho psychology going on here. And again, that's the important part. So what you need to do with this topic, because it is so heated and so many emotions come from it, you, we need to have things in place, not only when we're talking to someone, but resources that we can get to them and over time have those discussions. It's all about having that discussion. So for me, it's almost like when you're talking to someone, you need to gauge someone where they're at. Are they a Bible literalist? Well, then you start going that direction. Are they into conspiracies? Okay, great, that's awesome. But they are still believing that the 9-11 you know, official report is the truth. Well, you got some work to do. I don't think you should be bringing up the moon landing's fake until you deal with, you know, there's deceptions in the world. So everyone's kind of on a scale. And I explained that, that really there's a conspiracy theorist in everyone. I mean, the biggest conspiracy was conspiring to kill the Messiah, to kill Jesus. So again, conspiracies are here. There's nothing scary about that word. You know, the CIA taking that word and making it tinfoil hattery, you know, but again, it's conspiracy facts. And these things are really, truly happening. And most people, no matter if they don't want to look at 9-11 or chemtrails or the moon landing, most people will sit there and say, well, that GFK thing, yeah, something fishy is going on. So there's always that spectrum. And I always say that we're probably on the upper echelon of that spectrum. So having materials, having resources to get to people like Scientism Exposed, 
like different things of talking to people that, you know, we can broach this topic, you know, in, in a, a gradual way. We have this tendency sometimes to think that we got to convert that person right away. And, and again, we don't have to. Let's just get into the discussion. Let's start talking it. And as long as people are open and they're willing to, you know, ask questions, to, to search for the truth and go on that journey together, then I think that we should go on that journey with people no matter what level they're at. Maybe they're not even at flat earth, but they're geocentric. Hey, I'm all cool with that. I, I have no problem with that. Even if someone is not there yet, then fine. As long as they're, you know, wanting to engage and, and see things and materials, I think those are the type of people we need to focus on, not the people that are slinging mud and calling us every name in the book. You know, we need to focus our time on that type of thing. And that's what the Scientism Exposed was put together for with the movie, with all these gentlemen, was to portray what we are passionate about. And in, when it comes to the topic of flat earth, but have it presented in a way that it will be well received and it would be easily em embraced basically to get to that point. Because once they had watched the movie, they'd say, I want to know more. And they would go and they would get really to the meat of it. So really it's kind of like the milk. You want the meat, you can go further. The documentaries, you know, were considered more for the milk. And really when it comes to what I have planned, I mean, I'm working on my first book right now. And I would say that my next film, it definitely will be about exposing scientism of some sort. That's all I can say at this point. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, I have a couple questions from the audience for the panel panel at large. So I'm going to ask these. Anybody who feels led to go ahead and jump in and answer this. Um, and the first question was from William, and he's asking if the end times was negotiable or changeable, could we have changed it with the concept of the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. So can we change the end times, first of all, and is it okay to do nothing as good men? Well, I'll jump in and just say this. I don't think there there's certain Bible prophecies that are going to come to pass. They're, they're not going to change. Um, but within that, within those prophecies, I think what our goal should be all the way to the end, all the way to the second coming of Jesus, our goal should be, to get as much truth of the word of God and the gospel to as many people as we can to win as many people, snatching them, pulling them, you know, from the, from sin and from the kingdom of darkness and from all that deception and leading them to, to Jesus and to being, uh, you know, in, in faith into repentance and salvation and being born again and knowing their sins are washed away. And that, so within that, what I'm saying is within uh, there, there's a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of things I don't believe are determined. And, you know, Jesus talked about this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world and then the end shall come. And what he was saying is you, you never quit. You know, we never quit uh, as Christians. We should never, ever quit. No matter, no matter if we think the ends tomorrow, I wouldn't quit uh, preaching the gospel and trying to tell somebody the truth, lead them to the truth of the word of God, lead them to, repentance and faith in, in Jesus Christ as their savior. I mean, that's just, uh, that's the way I would answer that anyway. Paul says, I preach to all men that mayhaps God gives some repentance. We don't know who he'll give repentance to. So we preach to all men. <clears throat> I think the end is, you know, it's obviously been prophesied. It's going to happen. It's going to come. Um, does it necessarily have to happen on our watch? I don't know. There, there was a time when I was in the so-called prophecy circuit doing, you know, seminars and stuff with these people who would, you know, you, when you, when you listen to them, you, you think that tomorrow's the end of the world, you know, you better liquidate all your assets, get gold and silver. Now, uh, God, gold and gun, God, gold, guns, and groceries <laughs> stuck up on the four G's. Um, cause it's, it's coming any second now. Well, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. What do we do with that? Hmm. You know, I, I, I do think that it is possible. It is possible for us to stay God's judgment through repentance. Um, and so, you know, the more that we get on God's page, you know, the longer I think we have. But as the world goes, I think the more we get off of God's page, then the quicker his wrath is coming. I think another thing that is important to realize is that, especially for the listeners out there, that even though 
prophecy is laid out. God knows the end from the beginning, and he's put it in his word. And there are certain signs that, you know, definitely uh, the times are accelerating. Uh, but still, we are still responsible for sharing as much as we can, as Pastor Dean said, of the truth and to take on the Great Commission in sharing the gospel and helping people to come to remembrance. And that we each must empower ourselves and encourage each other as brethren, as family in Christ, to come to the knowledge of truth and to help people to prepare for those things that are coming, no matter when and, and where it may be, but that we definitely have to use what time we have. Each day is a blessing, and we have to use these days and these moments to bring as many people as we can to the truth and bring them to deeper and more profound relationship with uh, the creator and the creation as with the work that all of us have done on on this desk uh this movie that robbie has put forth i think it's blessed a lot of people's lives and that's part of it all right well thank you guys um our next question was coming in from shaza sparkaletto and was asking do you guys believe that there are lands out there that have not been really discovered? Are there lands or bodies of land out there that we don't know about? On the earth? Yeah, on the earth. Um, I can imagine it. Maybe Dean can go into a little bit deeper. But, uh, I mean, it does say that there is the inha inhabit like inhabitable part of the earth. So maybe Dean can go into it a little bit more. I find it fascinating. I mean, I'm open to it. I mean, when it gets into like other worlds with other suns and moons and stuff, obviously, biblically speaking, I don't think that we can look at that. I know there's a lot of different theories out there. Like I said, if it lines up with the Bible, it's great. Once it contradicts the Bible, we've got problems. But I think there is a verse, Dean can maybe speak on it, as far as the habitable part of earth. Yeah, I know that's uh, Proverbs 8. It does talk about the, and of course, that's the chapter two. It talks about the Lord set, you know, he engraved and created a boundary and, I mean, even the Hebrew letters bear that out, that he created a boundary. But it does say that, that there is the inhabitable parts of the earth, which would give you the flip side of that coin, that maybe there are places outside that boundary. We, you know, we don't know. I mean, that's, that's of course, getting into some serious areas of speculation, which to me, and <laughs> I may be getting myself in trouble by saying this, but, you know, I don't think that actually matters whether there's more beyond the dome or the, you know, the ice wall region or uh, the ends of the earth. I mean, if there is fine, the Lord will show it to us one day. If not, uh, you know, for me, it's not important, you know? Well, there seems to be different maps like the Buddhist map that was discovered. And it seems to indicate that there are lands outside of the Antarctic circle that is being policed and you know explore exploration beyond that point is uh, not allowed but um, again whether that is true or not uh, I don't think that really we can come to know but uh, even in the Vedic cosmology in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam it speaks of lands that are uh, out and beyond uh, the circle of what we see with regard to the United Nations flag and the continental land masses we see portrayed on uh, that UN flag. The way I look at it though when it comes to when it comes to this question just really quickly is you know when we get into all these you know the Hebrews believe this and look at all the ancient cosmologies I mean to me it's almost like the flood story I mean you have all these complete you know flood stories but they're all varying degrees now the question is you know yeah they have the, the general theme but obviously we look at you know, obviously as the biblical as their final authority so we know that they're taking it you know from the Bible and they remember, you know, something of a flood and they have their different, you know, ways of telling it. But again, there are contradictions, you know, with the flood stories. If you look at all of them, they don't all line up. So I think in a way we got to be careful as Christians and as following the Bible as our final authority. We always have to look at it in regards like we saw a Buddhist map. We got to be able to say, look, they're conveying the same thing that all the cosmologies were similar. But when we start kind of looking in there, I think there's a bit of a danger. But I do agree with all the panelists saying that even if there lands out there, habitable 
you know, are not habitable. The fact is, it doesn't really matter. It's not relevant to this discussion because I don't believe that there would be people secretly living there and, you know, uh, this whole part of the plan. Like, really, it would be, maybe there's other land out there, but God didn't create man to live there yet. I know with the recent film that has kind of been on people's radar, uh, the, the Convex Earth film, in that particular um, documentary, they proposited that there was this land mass that they had seen with the weather balloon any of you guys who i know it's been on your radar uh what was your opinion on that particular uh insight that they were trying to provide really quickly and i'll let someone take care of it but the fact was in 2011 an alien in a bush told them that the earth was not flat it was convex and from there they did their seven year investigation so i'll just leave it at that saying that the whole premise of that show was based on the fact of you know and you can see the actual video on youtube this alien that obviously is a person dressed up talking like smeagol saying the earth isn't flat it's convex <laughs> it's like i mean it is it's embarrassed embarrassingly bad but when it comes to some of the experiments and stuff they were trying to do sure they were out there investigating but this whole idea there's a lot of trouble with this extra piece of lamb they found i don't know again i really don't see it biblically speaking and if we're going to look at the final authority if it's significant why wouldn't god mention it it's nowhere mentioned the whole idea that there's other parts out there or there's other countries and there's like civilizations mm -hmm. to me it's far-fetched i don't think it lines up biblically but again i don't think it's relevant either right now I well, Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to read. This is from Acts 17. This is something that has jumped out to me in, in the last few years, but where Paul was preaching in Athens and he says in verse 26, Acts 17, 26, he has made of one blood all nations of men. Well, wait, whoever, wait, whoever's typing, whoever's typing, hit mute because I, I couldn't hear anything Dean was saying. Okay. Somebody's mic. Somebody's, somebody needs to mute their mic. Yeah, now you're good. Okay. I was just saying, this is Acts 17, uh, verse 26, when Paul was preaching at Athens, and he said, He hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, meaning the limits. So, the, you know, we are limited now to where men can inhabit. And so I don't, even if there are, things outside i don't believe that mankind or any men are living there just according to that and again so that's you know uh he's talking about too you know he's talking about the ends of the earth the boundary the actual as far as you can go and he set that boundary and men cannot go beyond it now they may be obsessed that's why maybe they they're obsessed with antarctica you know the global elite they're they're obsessed with it because they think there's something out there because of the buddhist map or because of some legend or whatever and they think they can find more land or wealth or whatever but <laughs> i mean god said i set a boundary and and man is not going beyond it well one of the uh things that comes to mind there too is second corinthians 2 11 where it says uh uh it depends on what version you're using but king james it says lest satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices in other words know the schemes of your adversary and know that there's going to be lies. Know that there's going to be, you know, he's he's the father of lies. There's going to be lying signs and wonders. And here's another thing, too, I, I think that uh, we've got to understand is that, you know, it says it says that there are going to be those that are going to try and cover themselves up with rocks, with the rocks, because they, they're going to try and hide from our Messiah upon his return. For some reason, they, this this it seems like there's this message that's being programmed into people that, you have to get away. You're going to get away from from this destruction that's coming. Uh, you know, you you've got to get to this next place. You, and and you run, 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 run. Fear, fear. And it's not the proper fear of God that, that they're not telling them that the that the destruction is going to be from our Father, and that there's no you know they're not teaching you to have a have a healthy fear of God. It's the beginning of all wisdom. All that's being thrown out the window when they think that we can go to the next place like it's a lily pad. And I, and I I. I can see the deception in that. I believe that's that's another satanic uh, trick, to be honest with you. I don't think there's another place to go. What's the difference between good flat earth theories and research and bad ones that really just make people look just as crazy as they sound to people who believe in a glob globular earth? Are you asking me that? Anybody. Um, oh. What's the difference between good research and bad research? Because I've heard people put out some stuff regarding the flat earth that is just way out there. <laughs> Well, I think when 
in the flat earth community is just as guilty as the scientism community of putting forth beliefs without any substantial proof of that belief that then you end up with all kinds of crazy stuff where people come up with whatever they want to make up, you know, and put it out there. I think it, it, good science, whether you're a flat earther or not, period, should be observable, repeatable, testable. You should be able to, to go out and observe something, test it, and repeat those tests and have other people be able to do the same thing, you know, to either agree with what you, you the, the findings that you had or not, you know. Uh, but there are people out there who are making up all kinds of crazy stuff. And, you know, just because it's on YouTube doesn't mean it's true. We have a question from Leslie that's asking, these scientismists believe that the ancient Egyptians were smart and skilled enough to build the pyramids. Then explain why they also believed in flat earth under a dome. So they think they're smart enough to make the pyramids, yet they push away their beliefs in the flat earth. Why is that? Well, they I don't know that they believe that the Egyptians were smart enough to make the pyramids because they're coming up with nonsense like ancient aliens did it. You know, with, with all of our wisdom and understanding and technology today, we still can't figure out how to pyramids or, you know, pick a megalithic structure out there. We can't figure out how they were made. You know, some of us who've done research on Genesis 6 and all that would probably say they had help, uh, you know, the Nephilim and fallen angels and stuff and whatnot. But I, I think mainstream science, they're kind of clueless. I mean, they haven't come up with a working model to show how human beings could have done could have done it. So, you know, on the one hand, you have evolution going completely bankrupt. So they're subscribing to panspermia, that ancient aliens showed up and seeded this world with the, the necessary ingredients and kickstarted evolution, you know, because they know evolution doesn't work on its own. So they're already seeding us with the idea of ancient aliens for our origins. So it's not a big stretch then for them to say that these same ancient aliens were also responsible for things like the pyramids. Now, uh, we have another question here. I know it was addressed earlier, but it was, why is it that every celestial body we can see from Earth is round, yet people believe that the planet we're on is not? Yeah, I addressed I, that I, one earlier. Yeah, well, I mean, Rob, well, Rob addressed that. Rob, Rob addressed that. But, I, you know, as somebody, an amateur, when I first got interested in this, this topic, I started exploring what I could see with a 10-inch Celestron telescope. Right. That was it. Just having fun. And all of this talk that, you know, people standing here on this terrestrial ground that we walk are looking up and seeing spherical bodies. They are lying to themselves because when you look at it with anything that's available to us, all you see is a light in the sky that's that's circular. It doesn't necessarily mean it's spherical. And so I, you know, I, I, the only pictures that really indicate the depth of what we look at are the ones that NASA produces that are completely CGI. But on top of that, Rob and many others, they always, they always have a great saying, since when does the basketball determine the shape of the court? Even if they are spherical, why does that inherently lead to the, why does that logically conclude that, you know, we have to be on a sphere too? It just doesn't. One isn't necessarily subsequent to the other. Well, I agree. And I think, well, like I said before, it's a big yeah. lie. The whole earth is a planet. I think there's so much deep meaning to that. If you actually start dissecting that and understand how big a lie the earth is a planet is, it really starts coming together. I honestly think that more research should be done on that because I think it's the hardest thing for people to understand. You hear this over and over is because it's like, but everything, all the planets around, we have to be around. Well, the earth is not a planet. Find out biblically where the earth is a planet. That's it. Find out. Well, that, that's it too. And it's, it, you know, once again, like uh, Skiba stated earlier, you know, the stars aren't what we're being told. Um, and the st the wandering stars, you know, why? I mean, come on. If you're, if you're going to set out to deceive the masses and you're going to set them up and you're a snake in the grass and time is not necessarily of essence to what you're going to do and it can take as long as you need it to, and God's going to ordain it to happen. He's going to allow it to happen. He's going to allow this to go. He even says, I'm going to send a strong delusion that you don't think that they already, they had to think of, hey, here's the costume you have to wear. Here's what we should look like. I'm not saying that's what they're doing. What I'm saying is you don't think that those that are going to trick everybody or the masses, you don't think that he's going to have enough in his thought process to say, you need to look like this. You need to look like this. You need to look like this. You stay on this pattern. You stay on this pattern. 
I mean, whether or not that's God's decision to do that, whether or not that's the, the wandering stars being rebellious or however people, some people believe, if if we don't look at that for what that is, if you can't identify that, and they're gonna believe they're gonna believe this, and we're gonna believe this because of testing it. This is these are the ones that you have to understand. They haven't had their eyes and ears turned on yet. And that's I mean, you're you can't prove you can't prove it. You can't prove anything. And and Jared, not to go against you on that, but you know, I've looked through uh, telescopes at, at big a big telescope before, and I can tell you, man, that what they're saying they're seeing. Some of these guys are actually seeing the same thing that I saw, and they do look like there's something out there. It doesn't necessarily do that. But then again, I just saw a video of, of somebody that that sent uh, me a video of, of Polaris uh, last night that somebody took from a plane. And it looks like a giant honeycomb once the once the 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 picture was able or whatever camera they're using, which I don't know what kind of lens. It could be CGI, I don't know, but it's very close to what some of these people have taken with the Coolpix 900, where when you get in, it looks like there's water, you know, going over the top of the surface of of whatever that is. Right. And, I, I have no doubt it's out there. I guess my question would be, can you tell it's spherical from what you're looking at, or is it a bright light? I mean, obviously there's something there, but you know, the argument that people make that it's a ball that you got all these other balls out there. So why aren't we a ball? Right. Every right, time right. I look at something, I'm like, well, there's something there, but it's not, you can't tell that it's a, it's spherical or a plane. You're seeing something that doesn't even match with NASA showing you, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm with you 100%. And that's what I'm saying. I th I think that, that that what we're looking at up there uh, is not, we're not going to have all those answers. I don't believe until he comes back. I think that's that's actually meant to not even give uh, to worry about. And that's the one thing is, you know, one of the things that I've always said is I'm going to try and stick to what I know. And I'm going to stick to the tangible science, the observations and the data, because once you start looking at the bones and the fossils, like what Joe's, you know, had so you can look at like physical relevance of here on the ground right here in the earth and then you can go stand on the shore and you can look further than what you're supposed to be able to see according to the math they've given us all bets are off once their math and they fail their own math test and that's what that's what i think the whole community hasn't stood up on is no i want the answers to this right here right now this curvature there's not one bridge that 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 uh, can you know uh, do a litmus test and and come across with uh you know outstanding credentials behind it uh nowhere uh then you like i said you you get up in a plane the, the noses aren't different all these things that you can actually see for yourself it, i don't know why but the argument always seems to go up instead of focusing down here where we're at where we can actually observe because what we're seeing up here come on the sun's on a circuit the moon's on a circuit they're in a constant drift you know this has been recorded time and time again and um you know it's just like this here's another question that that hasn't been answered you know a few years back maybe four or five years ago um la marzulli actually had seen the same thing uh, but i had noticed that the moon had actually rotated i don't know if you guys remember this or not but the moon had actually rotated where it was like 135 degrees. And if that was the case, do you realize that the tsunamis, if, if the moon was part of a gravitational pull on the heavenly body of the gravitational system, everything would have been completely annihilated if the moon had rotated 135 degrees. I mean, that's like taking uh, a doorknob and having rubber bands stretched to it that would affect another you know, wheel. And when you turn that, that's exactly what it would have done to us. It would have messed us up and nothing happened. And it was also not, it wasn't put out there by the science community. And yeah, he, correct me if I'm wrong, but there wasn't a single university or academic deal that would ever even address what it no, just they happened. went to Pepperdine. They actually, I believe he went to Pepperdine University where there's an observatory there and they wouldn't answer any questions. They didn't want to talk about it. And he put videos <laughs> out. So crazy. Because that was one of the most interesting things I had ever witnessed with my own eyes. I remember standing out there taking pictures of it. Look, I was doing this. Yeah. Like, what, what is going, what's going on here? My wife did the same thing. She's like, oh, I see it now. Yeah. It was like, uh, yeah, it was, it was weird. Which I think somebody in Australia paid a lot of money to have that done just so that they could see the moon differently for the first time. But <laughs> everyone wants to be American, man. <laughs> I'll send that one out to Luke. <laughs> But you yeah, know, no, I just, I see this stuff happening, man. And you, you go, where's the science community about this? How come they didn't bring this up? This is huge. And it's because it calls them out. Just like Joe said, you can't put those bones in the museums because it's going to you know, validate the scriptures.
completely. And and at that point in time, you're faced with there is Messiah, there is a judgment. You better be right. You better repent. You better turn back. You better die to your flesh. You better bear your cross daily. Or else, it's his story, not yours. You just get to be a part of it. Rick, you had kind of answered this last question I was going to ask, but it was, okay, I'm interested. Where do I start if I want to test this out myself? Does anybody else have any suggestions for somebody who we might have caught their attention and now they want to figure this out for themselves? Where do they start in terms of testing these concepts out? Look for the curvature. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Is that sin? Was yes. That sin? Yeah, it's in. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Get in a plane. If you got 600 bucks, go buy the Nikon Cool Picks P900 and just start watching ships go out to sea. <laughs> and reappearing. And, re yeah, and reappearing. They're reappearing as they're going away. Or like Dean and others have done, you know, shoot across lakes and stuff like that, you know, long distances and, you know, look up the curvature math and, and see what you're not supposed to see that you will see in that camera. Uh, I, I was visiting my family. My parents, uh, they're snowbirds. They live in Massachusetts, but go down to Florida for the winter. And uh, we went out to eat one day and we were at a dock that was right in some fishing boats and everything. And it was around sunset. And the boats were going out to go fishing. And I thought, oh, this would be great, you know. So I set the camera up nice and low, you know. And literally, these 15-foot high ships were leaving the dock right there. And I watched them go all the way out four or five miles. And they just kept – I they were there the whole time. And at four miles, I forget what the math is. I think it's something like 10 feet. 10, 10 feet of the ship should have been missing. Uh, but I could see the whole thing. And it's kind of funny. My dad – because, you know, he, he knows what I've been talking about. He hasn't – embraced it or anything like that but you know he's been cool with my research whatever so uh you know there my family's there and i've got my camera set up with the little view screen and everything and i said dad you know because there were mile markers that those ships were going out that you knew what the mile markers were i'm like dad that ship's almost five miles out I said, look at that he came walking over and he looks at the view screen he looked at me and then walked away <laughs> <laughs> hey that was what happened we were at uh we were at mobile this last time february 3rd and we had you know like three or four people out there with p900s we had telescopes we had the water temperature the air temperature gauges i mean we had the full thing going on and people were walking up saying what are you guys doing and we'd say i'd say come here look through the telescope look through this camera i said what do you see over there and, you know, we could see the cranes and we could see, you know, we, we even got to the point. We haven't even put it all out yet. We're going to. But you could see the the dock. You could see the shipping containers on docks. You could see the ships where they were sitting being loaded and stuff. You, you know, that was uh, 12 to 14 miles. We could see the uh, from Fairhope, Alabama, we could see across the bay to Mobile and see the uh, circuit court building that we should not be able to see eight stories of we could see the second floor and we have all those pictures and people were coming up and i said well what we're doing here is we're proving that the earth's flat because you shouldn't be able to see that and they were just be like oh and what was amazing is there was only a few people that walked away and said you know oh looking at us like we're crazy the rest of them were like huh really you know so i i think that just something very simple like that you know if people would just take the time like, you know, my brother is a, is a science teacher. He's a high school science teacher, born again Christian. I led him to Jesus in 87. Uh, he, you know, he, he loves the Lord. He loves the word of God. He's a soul winner, but he will not turn loose of scientism. And I have, I have said, come with us, go with us to uh, Mobile Bay and, and you come and you tell me what you see. He won't do it to this day. He won't do it. Um, I'm going to get him down there one day though here soon we got a we got a new laser we're gonna try it next so. i've had people tell me they're scared to see it that they're actually afraid to look because they're afraid of what it would do to the probably their whole psyche i guess i don't know well the tools are there. available to us i mean the the book uh zetetic astronomy uh i thought i had it right here zetetic astronomy by samuel robinum uh you know written in 1865 i think it was i mean the whole it's like 300 pages of tests that this guy did and, you know, here we are in the 21st century. We should be able to take the exact same tests that he did and do them better. 
with the equipment that we have. So, I mean, here's a whole book laid out for us that, that, that gives us the roadmap for tests that we can do. And here's another fun one right here. Is just go online and download this app. Theodolite is the name of the app. It's like $6 or something like that. Theodolite, go download this app. And basically all you need to do is line up whatever you want to take a picture of in the crosshairs and it will freeze frame all of the data and everything and start taking pictures of the sun and moon. <laughs> the moon is easier because you don't have to do a lens flare and stuff like that, but uh, because of the brightness. But I mean, I had a friend of mine who he's a flat earther and his brother's not, and he lives in Washington state. His brother lived, uh, lived in um, Colorado and they said, okay, Hey, you know what? Um, why don't we both go out with this theodolite and on the count of three, we'll both snap a picture of the moon. Because if you know the distance between two locations, whatever you're looking at, you can try and you could triangulate to determine the distance of the third object, as long as you know the distance between the other two. So they know the distance between their houses and there are plenty of tools online that they can verify that with. So they go outside, ready? One, two, three. Yep. Click. They both take a picture of the moon and the crosshairs. They get the data. They go to calculator.net, which is not a flat earth website. It's a, just a math website. You can calculate, uh, th do the triangulation on the website. And they did several tests. And every time it showed up that the moon was less than 300 miles away. So then there's another dude that my friend in Washington State knew that lived in Houston. So you got Washington State in Houston, Texas. They went outside, took this $6 app, went outside, took pictures, did the same thing came up with the same results. So then they take this stuff to a, to a university and they say, Hey, well guys, what do you think of this, uh, this theodolite app? And after looking at it, checking out, they're like, wow, this is, this would be a great tool for surveyors and stuff. You know, they're really praising the app. Yeah. Cool. What do you think of that uh, website? Calculator.net. Oh, that's a great website. Everybody uses that, you know, for math. Okay. So the website that you just endorsed and that app that you thought was really cool, both just said that the moon is less than 300 miles away. <laughs> You know, you know, uh, you know, this is something everybody can do <laughs> for six bucks. Awesome. Well, that was the last question that I'm going to ask. And if there's any closing thoughts that anybody wanted to share here regarding this battle between science and scientism, between truth and fiction and the religion that is pushed as modern doctrine and and uh and theories as 100 percent fact does anybody have any closing thoughts before we end up to tonight's show i do don't put so much stock in people that call themselves scientists amen to that <laughs> don't believe any of us go out there and do the experimentation for yourself see it with your own eyes your own experience and make it true for yourself, and then you'll realize that there's no curvature, and that in and of itself, you know, forces you to reconsider everything that we've been taught and think we know. And I, I would just add to all of that: pray. Amen. Okay, First John two says you have no need of a teacher. Let the Holy Spirit be your teacher. Okay, and just start with Genesis one. You're not going to get very far. I'll just tell you that up front. But if you <laughs> if you pray and say, Father, show me the truth from your word. That's a prayer that God's definitely going to answer. Okay. He's definitely going to answer this prayer. Father, show me the truth from your word and ask God to help you to remove your preconceived biases because we all bring them to the text. We have denominational biases. We have all kinds of biases that we've developed over time and over listening to the teachings that other people gave us and whatnot is try to remove all of that before approaching the text. Father, just clear my mind of all personal bias. Let me just read your word and teach me what it says. And just start with Genesis 1. Awesome. Well put. Yeah, I want to just make sure that I uh, mentioned that uh, every one of the guys that are on the panel, just a huge thank you, you know, for your involvement in the film, like just everything that uh, the contributions that you made. Did we lose him? Yeah, his audio is cutting out there, I think. Hey, Robbie, uh, I think we're having trouble picking up your audio there. Oh, he's on mute now. And now he just went back in time. He's in black and white. 
<laughs> well, um, I'll just continue it on. Of thank you everybody for coming on to this panel tonight. It's been a pleasure to have you, and uh, and I know your involvement of Scientism Exposed Two is why you guys joined us tonight because you all have this passion for truth. And I wanted to thank you all for coming on tonight to discuss with us this topic. And I want to, to share real quickly, if anybody's interested in getting Robbie's film, Scientism Exposed 2, you can jump over to uh, CelebrateTruth.org and you can order it there. Um, you can also uh, get the film on uh, the NYSTV.org subscription site. We have uh, Scientism Exposed 2 there and also scientism exposed one and i believe if you're a new member you can get 10 percent off with se2 uh, it's a promo code that we have for robbie there so once again everybody thank you for just coming on this panel tonight uh dean uh joe rick rob robbie jared and zen it's been a pleasure uh having all of you interact on this panel and for anybody watching, thank you for tuning in to Now You See TV. If you like our content, share, like, and subscribe, please. It's free, and it helps us out get the truth out, uh, episodes like this and this panel. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Now You See TV. And I've been your host, Jake Grant. Until next time, good night, everybody. Take care. Have a great night, guys. God bless. God See bless. You. Blessings to you. Thanks for having me. Come on.